All right, good afternoon, everyone. We'll call this October 10th meeting of the Planning and Environment Committee to order. And looking to colleagues for declarations of pecuniary interest. Okay, seeing none, we can move on to the consent items. Anything we'd like pulled? I would suggest pulling number, uh, where are we? Number six, yes. Okay. Five, six, and five. Alrighty, so we'll take a motion on the balance. Okay, moved and seconded, we'll open the vote. Closing the vote, the motion carries five to zero. Okay, so colleagues, we have a gap in our timed items this afternoon, so I wonder if we can put these items five and six to later on in the meeting when we have some time to kill so we don't have to have a recess. So noting already. So we'll move five and six to later in the meeting. And now we'll move on to agenda item number eight, PPM for application by 1891614 Ontario Inc., property located at 1835 Dundas Street. We'll take a motion to open the PPM, please. Closing the vote, the motion carries five to zero. Take it away, Mr. Thomas Inzik. Thank you, Madam Chair. And I do just want to acknowledge Brian Turcotte's assistance on this. Uh, he is one of the four planners who uh, th uh, has left the planning department to seek other opportunities through a promotion. So I was able to carry this across the finish line, but he did the brunt of the work. This is an application at 1835 Dundas Street. It's on Dundas, almost near Clark Road, so just west of Clark Road on the south side. It was a former automotive dealership, and uh, the request is to change the zoning to expand the range of commercial uses. This is just a, a, a view of the site right now. It's a bit dated because the what was formerly the automotive service building or the sales building, you see that in the right-hand side, is now actually used by the City of London for uh, the Ontario Works Office in East London. Uh, the picture at the bottom uh, left is the rear of the site, and uh, you can see the street just sort of ends in a dead end. And I'll talk about that later on, but uh, there's vegetative growth and, and there's no through street there. And that becomes significant for the setback reductions that I'll talk about. This is the proposed development. The building at the left-hand corner is the existing building that's gonna, that houses the existing City of London offices. And the two buildings in hatching are what's proposed to be developed through the infilling of the site. The building to the rear or to the right of the picture, uh, you can see the setbacks are right at the property line. And this is to help uh, provide for septet opportunities by minimizing gaps between the fence bushes, shrubbery in the building where uh, where people can congregate in the dark and, and uh, do certain things. They're finding right now um, needles and, and other paraphernalia like that, which is causing some concern for uh, septet opportunities. So the in intent is to minimize those setbacks in the dark where, where that kind of activity can happen. In terms of the policies, all the policies to seem to line up to recommend support for this uh, proposal. It, fits, it facilitates a development of appropriate range and mix of uses on the site. Um, it's in the settlement area in, in an urban part of the area, a very urban part of the area, where uh, development and redevelopment and growth is encouraged. And uh, th this proposal will enhance the vitality of Dundas Street. That's one of the city's main streets, and we would like to see that happen as well. In terms of the official plan, uh, the proposed uses, again, are four square with the types of uses that are contemplated in the auto-oriented commercial corridor designation. And the site is a pretty large site, so it's uh, suitable to accommodate this level of intensity. And of course, when it comes to form, the policies actually encourage infilling and redevelopment and conversion of existing buildings, which is exactly what this site is doing, uh, converting one and infilling on the other portions of the site. 
Uh, one other key policy here is the official plan transit nodes and corridors policy. Right now, in our current official plan, it identifies this portion of Dundas Street to Argyle Mall as a transit corridor. And you can see the subject site is, is on the corridor, almost at the node. And this is where um, the policies actually discourage council from uh, supporting uses that are less intense. So the policies want uses to get more intense, which I believe this uh, rezoning represents. London plan, again, is almost identical to the official plan when it comes to this area of the city. Uh, the intensity policies here are new, but this proposal, again, fits four square. The intensity requires a minimum height of two-story uh, buildings, and the illustration at the bottom is the new building that's proposed to be developed right up at the Dundas Street frontage. The retail uses may exceed 6,000 square meters, see the policy, uh, but office uses are limited to 2,000 square meters. And this proposal is within those, both those limits. And um, it also directs buildings to be located along street walls to create that street wall. And again, this proposal fulfills that. So the zoning change. Right now, the zoning on the site is ASA 5 and RFC 6. While those zone codes may mean nothing to you, in plain language term, they accommodate um, automotive uses, automotive sales, automobile uh, repair establishments, those sorts of things. The type of things that facilitated the old Chrysler dealership. Uh, the zoning amendment now is to go to a new range of retail uses, which is more retail, commercial, office focus, away from that automotive-oriented uses that previously existed on the site. There are special provisions being requested through the zoning and by, uh, bylaw amendment to reduce some of those setbacks that we talked about. And again, there's that illustration here to minimize the setbacks between property lines and fences and shrubbery and the building, uh, essentially to ensure that um, the crime prevention through the environmental design can flourish where right now there are some questionable activities going on on the site. And so we're recommending uh, that the uh, zoning bylaw amendment as proposed be approved by planning committee and council. And that's it. Thank you. Any technical questions from committee at this point? Councillor Turner? Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. And through you to Mr. Tom Sinsick. Um, just with respect to the, uh, the setbacks, the one thing that did jump out at me, uh, uh, thanks for explaining the septet uh, um, rationale for the, the rear building. That's the, uh, the eastern building itself um, has a zero setback on the property line of a, of a residential neighboring property. And I, uh, I was wondering if you might be able to comment on, on the suitability of that in that circumstance. It seems, uh, it seems like an odd uh, request in there. Uh, Madam Chair, actually, uh, so the, the building that you see, in, or the site plan that you see in front of you, the building at the north, uh, at the top right-hand corner, it abuts a commercial property of the zero lot line. So it is zoned uh, ASA, again, the same type of zones that are being requested here. And, and they actually don't need a special provision for where the two commercial properties abut. You can have a zero setback there. It's where you get further south um, uh, that that you get into the residential areas. And in fact, we um, talked about an increased setback from those property lines. And uh, I'll just turn to my bylaw here. So I'm on, I'm on page 70 of the, of the council agenda. And uh, Roman numeral four, we require a 5.5 meter setback from those resi residential zones along Avondale. So we've actually uh, bumped that up to 5.5 meters to accommodate the landscape strip. Uh, thank you. Uh, so I, I guess uh, the, the building to its east of the eastern building is, it looks like a house, but it's a commercial property. Uh, it is zoned commercially. I, I can't comment whether or not it's being uh, used for residential purposes right now. If it is, it would be legal non-conforming. Um, but it, they don't need a special provision for that zero setback. Thank you, that helps a lot. Councillor Hopkins. Yes, thank you, Madam Chair and to staff. Just wanted to know a little bit more about the fencing. Is fencing provided here on the property? Madam Chair, the fencing will be dealt with through site plan, although the uh, conceptual site plan that you see in front of you does propose security fencing. The details of that I'm, I'm not aware of. Perhaps the applicant can explain that further, but fencing will be dealt with through site plan. Anything further at this time? Okay. Would the applicant like to speak? Okay, you just come up and state your name and who you're working for. 
Good afternoon, committee. My name is Matt Campbell here from Zelenka Prima on behalf of the applicant. Uh, I think Mr. Thomas Insick did uh, a good job of, uh, overviewing the application. Um, I don't have anything further to add to what he said uh, in response to Councillor Hopkins' question regarding fencing. That's something that we're going to be looking at through uh, the site plan process. We realize that there are gaps in the fence, the, the infrastructure, the physical barriers uh, are, aren't there, uh, and they keep getting taken away by uh, people that are using the site. So we're going to be looking at doing some sort of upgraded fencing, something that's a bit stronger. But again, that's going to be worked through the site plan process with city staff. Be happy to answer any other questions that you have. Thank you, Mr. Campbell. Any technical questions of the applicant? Okay. Seeing none, we can move on to members of the gallery. If you'd like to speak on this issue, if you come to the microphone and state your name and address. Okay. Ask again for further speakers on this. And no one's rushing to the microphone, so I guess we can take a motion to close the PPM. Okay, it's been moved and seconded. We can call a question. Closing the vote, the motion carries five to zero. Okay, looking for speakers, committee. Councillor Turner. It seems like a quite acceptable uh, and reasonable proposal. It uh, looks like it makes good use of the uh, the land. Um, the uh, the parking reductions uh, themselves uh, are acceptable to me as well. Uh, it's on a transit corridor. It makes sense to have all that there. Uh, my only concerns had been uh, addressed in my technical questions, uh, uh, and uh, I, I think it uh, uh, will end up being a good use of the land. Thank you, Councillor. Anything further, Councillor Helmer? Although I agree with the idea of the fencing and the setback as a way of sort of mitigating some of the issues that are perhaps coming up through the rear of the property, um, just looking at the area, I think <clears throat> something we need to think about as a planning committee is you know, this is a pretty long block uh, where we don't have a connection through Hilton Ave. It's like 400 meters basically between Edmonton and um, the street that is immediately to the east. And I can see why people want to cut through because they don't want to walk around because it's too far to walk around. And, uh, you know, we've got a cul-de-sac there at Hilton, which is ending the street and it, it just doesn't come right out to uh, Dundas. I imagine there's historical reasons why that happened, but, you know, barring an actual sort of designed connection, I think it's, it's understandable that pedestrians are trying to find a cut through. Once there are buildings there, I think it will um, mitigate that issue a bit. I imagine people are going to end up going uh, east rather than west because it's a bit of a longer a walk. But I'm not sure the problem will totally disappear. And uh, in terms of the zoning for this particular property, I support it. I don't know that the burden of fixing the pedestrian mobility problem in this area uh, really falls on this one property. Um, I do think, too, if you see where that, I think it's a condo complex that's immediately to the south. You know, the parking lot essentially goes right into the road. And the road is dead ended on both sides, and it's, you know, we should never do that again. <laughs> it's not, it's not good. So, uh, you know, I think it's it's not a surprise that we've got these issues there, and hopefully the redevelopment of the site um, uh, deals with it, and, and we don't have it as an ongoing problem. Thank you, Councillor. Any further speakers on this? Seeing none, can we have a motion? Okay, moved by Councillor Cassidy, seconded by Councillor Turner. We'll call the question. Closing the vote, the motion carries five to zero. Thank you, colleagues. On to agenda item number nine. We'll take a motion to open the PPM. This is for a property located at 4380 Castleton Road. Okay, just looking for a seconder. Thank you, Councillor Turner. Cassidy. Okay. Closing the vote, the motion carries five to zero. Alrighty, Mr. Thomas Inzik. Thank you, Madam Chair. And, and this is another one where I would like to acknowledge Brian's work. 
there is also an added item uh, on your added item agenda. It's a letter in response to this application. I, I should say that the letter came in after the report was submitted to clerk, so I wasn't able to influence the, uh, the staff recommendation, but I wanted to point that out. This is a subject site located at Castleton, which is just southeast of the Highway 401 and Wellington Road uh, interchange. You can actually see the Highway 401 interchange just at the top left-hand corner of the site. And the request is to develop this site for a transport ter terminal, essentially a place to park trailers uh, and, and transfer trailers from one uh, truck to another. There is no building being proposed and the area would be paved with asphalt and only concrete dollies would be provided for the trailers. Uh, just to give you an indication of where uh, the site resides here, it's located in a cluster of properties that already accommodate light industrial uses and it's noteworthy that there are lands in proximity to the site that are either zoned for or um, are already used to facilitate uh, transport terminals. So if I'll just follow with my mouse here. This uh, purple rectangle is actually a uh, rural settlement area. But on lands to either side of it, there are the lands are zoned LI6, exactly what this proposal is requested to do. And lands immediately, immediately to the north are also not only zoned LI6, but are used as a transit terminal. So this is our subject site. Well, it's in proximity to the uh, uh, rural settlement lands. It is the most furthest removed from those that are ex already existing LI6 zoned. Uh, the provincial policy statement does support these types of uses in light industrial areas. And specifically, there is a, uh, a term in the provincial policy statement called freight supportive. And uh, land use patterns within se settlement areas are encouraged to be built efficiently, but also to ensure that they are freight supportive. And so uh, in our opinion, this is a freight supportive use in conformity to the provincial policy statement. The official plan designates this as light industrial. And while transport terminal use is not explicitly listed as a defined term in the official plan, that's not uncommon. That's typically what a zoning bylaw is for. And there is uh, the LI6 zone, which has this use embedded within it. So it suffice to say it is consistent with the light industrial designation. Um, in terms of intensity, there is a, a policy in the official plan that allows zoning and site plan control bylaws to specify higher standards for setbacks and landscaping adjacent to residential areas. So I just want to park that for a second because I'll talk about that in the zoning. Uh, and, and in terms of form, the official plan policies actually limit the amount of outdoor storage. Now that may seem counterintuitive to this application except for the fact that outdoor storage, that definition explicitly excludes transport terminal. So transport terminal is not considered outdoor storage for the purposes of, of the zoning bylaw. This area is also in the Southwest Area Plan, and this is the part of the Broccoli Industrial Neighborhood. And the policies are almost identical to that of the official plan, except that uh, they're, again, uh, consistent with the provincial policy statement. There is a policy in there that talks about the industrial sites in this area will focus on logistics types of industrial uses that involve the movement and transfer of goods, and that's specifically due to its proximity to the Highway 401 corridor. And again, there's this policy in there that talks about greater side yard and rear yard setbacks for new development within this area to be specified in the zoning bylaw for fencing and landscaping as well. Uh, so here is a close up look of the subject site in the nearest uh, broccoli rural settlement area. And policies in the secondary plan provide for landscaping and enhanced plantings, especially when they're in proximity, uh, 40 meters of proximity to the uh, rural settlement area. So what we have here is corner to corner is a 38.5 meter setback, uh, plus or minus. So we're almost reaching that 40 meters specified in the policy. And then as part of the zoning bylaw amendment application, the applicant is seeking a three meter, further three meter setback which will be comprised of landscaping to bridge that 1.5 meter gap and, and then some. In the London plan, this is as part of the, uh, identified as part of the light industrial place types. And the use is, again, almost uh, identical to our current OP, except for the fact that the London plan specifies logistics uses in light industrial place types. Um, the, in, these sites benefit from their proximity to the 401 corridor, which this one does, and, uh, and which is part of what the light industrial place types seek to achieve. 
So the zoning bylaw amendment, uh, we had to be specific about the setback because setbacks are typically measured from the building to the property line. So there's a special provision recommended that provides a setback from the paved area to the property line. And the intent of this setback is to facilitate a uh, perimeter landscape strip. And we took our guidance from the site plan bylaw. The site plan bylaw specifies where uh, property line meets a road allowance that there should be a three meter setback for landscaping and all the other interior property lines there should be a 1.5 meter setback. However, this applicant proposes a 15 meter setback from the road and the north property line again whereas three meters and 1.5 meters are specified and then recommends uh, a three meter setback on the south and east property line and as previously mentioned that three meters on the east side will bridge that gap between the required 40 meters and the 38.5. And so uh, we are recommending support for the application. Uh, the, it fits within the existing zoning permissions of the area. These uses are already either uh, located in the area or, or permitted to be located in the area. And uh, it uh, provides the setbacks necessary as per the policies of the Southwest Area Plan. Thank you. Thank you, any technical questions? Councillor Turner? Uh, thank you, Madam Chair, through you. Uh, thank you, Mr. Thompson. So uh, you answered the one question I had about uh, the reference to the 40 meter um, and how that's going to be established. So uh, that's helpful. The, um, the, I had two questions that left then. Um, one, uh, the property or the terminal building just to the north of the site uh, is all part of that same property. Uh, is that correct? And, and would the zoning application apply just to the southern portion of the property or to the entire parcel? Madam Chair, the, pro the terminal building to the north is independent of this site, so this will just uh, simply be a transport terminal. Fair enough, thank you. It looked like it was one parcel. Uh, the second uh, might be the, with respect to traffic and, uh, and movement near the residential properties along Dingman. Is that Dingman? Um, so Castleman, uh, north-south, uh, is there any consideration on how traffic would approach into this terminal? Uh, could it approach from the north uh, and not from the south, or can, can we be that specific in, in the way we address this application? Through you, Madam Chair. So uh, we, uh, staff will look into this in more detail when the site plan, site plan comes. I expect most of the traffic will be uh, from the west, from Wellington Street, just because it's coming from the highway. Uh, but we, we have asked in, uh, initially for a left-hand lane to be westbound left-hand lane into the, sorry, southbound left-hand lane into the site. So that's from a traffic perspective. But with respect to tra traffic distribution and, and all of this, we will, we will be dealing with that at the site plan level. Thank you. Thank you. That, that's helpful. I see that as probably the the most, uh, most impactful part of this application. Uh, Councillor Zafin. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I've heard, uh, and I know there'll be some people speaking on this matter today from the community uh, in the rural settlement just south of the property. Um, I was curious uh, to ask through you to staff um, why the setback on the west side of the property um, whereas you're looking at from the south end of the property where there's concern of both uh, water runoff onto properties in the south end as well as noise concerns to the property owners south of the property, um, that if there's a larger setback on the south uh, then, then provided more landscape there that may be of uh, benefit to the community members in the south. So just curious why that was done that way. Uh, Madam Chair, I, I hope I'm understanding the question correctly. So why the 15 meter setback to the north of the site versus where to the south of the site? So that was the request by the applicant. A uh, greater setback is something that we're pleased with. Certainly if, if it was applied on the south side, we'd be, or if they were inverted, we'd be happy as well. The, uh, the bigger issue was ensuring we met that 40 meter setback, which is provided in policy, which uh, we've achieved through that additional three meter setback. Okay, thank you. Any other technical questions? Councillor Helmer? For the uh, area behind the parking area that's along the south and the eastern boundaries, what are we talking about in terms of vegetation? 
uh, so the uh, the type of vegetation hasn't been established yet, and that's something we would work through through the site plan approval process. Would the applicant like to speak on this, Mr. Kirkness? Uh, thank you, Madam Chair, Planning Committee members and staff. Um, Kirkness Consulting is representing uh, Tara Forrestall, and I'm kind of looking around for her, uh, but I, I I don't think she's made it. I, um, uh, this is part of the London Suffords Warehouse uh, family that's located to the northeast, so it represents a business expansion, uh, homegrown business expansion. Um, this uh, tra transport terminal uh, really came to my office uh, from, a, from an engineering uh, perspective and this drawing you're looking at is the uh, development engineering's site servicing drawing. They're simply trying to work with the grades of the land as they are. Uh, so the stormwater retention area along the north side makes sense from the existing topographical perspective. There is some, of course, on the southwest corner as well, but that kind of explains hopefully to the ward councillor why the 15 meters is located on the north and not the south. Now we're not opposed to trying to look at uh, an alternative, but we would sure like to get through this rezoning. Um, and, <clears throat> and, uh, I think that uh, I think a key message in the planning report from your staff, which we appreciate very much because it is supportive and we agree with it and we hope you recommend it to council, um, uh, is um, that uh, the southwest area plan kind of uh, puts a higher level or raises the bar with respect to site planning for industrial uses here. Um, I don't think I've ever run across where we have setbacks for pavement. It's mostly buildings. Um, however, uh, we're working with it. Uh, you should notice that there's the same zoning that we're asking for is applied to many other properties adjacent. And so we're really just catching up uh, with respect to this site. But we're doing so and going beyond it because of this engineering and site design and coming before you and having entrenched in a zoning bylaw setbacks for pavement uh, that then provides for landscaped areas and proper drainage. So this site will be looking after itself uh, uh, for, for certain and that'll be uh, ensured through the site plan application with security and hopefully that provides the ward councillor with some, some comfort as well so that if there is some runoff happening in other industrial sites onto properties, uh, it, it, won't, it won't be this site. Uh, so uh, we're contributing to the solution, uh, not the problem. Hopefully you'll see it that way. Uh, so the forest halls would like to certainly uh, get on with uh, having their uh, transport terminal established and we thank the staff uh, for their report and we're, um, we're in support of it and hopefully you will be too, thank you. Thank you. Any technical questions of the applicant's representative? Okay, seeing none, we can go to members of the public. If you'd like to speak on this issue, come up to the microphone and state your name and address, please. Hello, my name is Alan Tipping, uh, 2809 Dingman Drive. I'm a member of the Broccoli Schaefer Coalition. Now I drove by this site tonight. Now I hope somebody can correct me if I'm wrong, but this shows a site that hasn't been touched yet. But if you look at the bigger picture of the property, which did not show up on the screen very well, they have excavated all the way over to Forest City Farming. So when you see this little picture of this piece of property, this is not all of it. It goes a lot farther, and when they're talking setbacks, this property is touching, not this specific piece, but the rest of their property is touching residential properties in the back corner. Um, if the city could put up that map again, I could explain where it's actually being seen it's touching the properties. I went to this site today, and I don't know if they even have an excavation permit, for this property. But if you look at their subject site, and you go down towards the bottom corner of the map, you'll see that purple 90 degree down there. That open land there has all been excavated now. So I don't know if this transport terminal is going all the way through to there, or it's just saying, staying on this little subject site. That's a question we have in the neighborhood. We were not notified that it's coming over to that other big piece of property that looks like it's not being touched. Another thing here, um, I've received many calls being a member of this coalition and 
that letter that came to us was like this, so it's not very clear to the residents where this terminal is actually going, how much of the land is being used. Um, we have had major water issues. Councillor Jared Zaifman can attest to that. He came out and saw him. We've been on the city to repair our ditches. We just got all hit with a $1,000 municipal drain bill from a facility that has a concrete parking lot, and the drain was full of gravel. But we paid for their mess. Okay, there is no sewers in this area. So when you pave land, where's all that water gonna go? Every building pretty much that has been built in this area has been built higher than existing residences. So all the existing residences are getting dumped on by water. One of your employees, Don Simpson, has seen this. He says there's not much he can do about it because that's the way it's coming through the city. We've got some properties that are four feet above our properties. This side of the street is actually lower than the roadway. Um, years ago, Forest City Forming was built. When they built that structure, they blocked off a ditch, which caused a lot of problem too. This site has a ditch that runs right between these two pieces of property. I looked at it today. The excavating is starting to go into that ditch. That's a water ditch. I hope it's not going to disappear. Um, all this water flows down to Dingman Creek, and if we don't have the proper slopes there, it's going to run into the residential backyards. Part of the noise problems is the beep, beep, beep of these trucks 24 hours a day backing up. And if you've ever heard an AC unit on the front of a transport that's starting to go bad, you, you won't be able to sleep with it there. Uh, it's, it's just noisy as can be. We're asking if this goes right along the bottom there that the company is forced to put at least a 15 foot berm with trees or fencing to protect those residential neighborhoods. Um, and if anybody's drove there, Castleton Road is already destroyed. These roads were never built to carry transports. They used to be chip and pavement. That's what they were. And over time, it's just turned into pavement. Castleton Road is cracked. It is destroyed already. I don't know how you're going to put a truck company there. Next thing here is the traveling coming through Broccoli. They cannot make a turn off Dingman Drive onto Castleton Road. The Ontario Driving School there has already wiped out that telephone pole three times because they can't make these turns. I would like to see the city enforce that none of these trucks can come through our residential area because it's the straight through way from Highbury Ave and it's a back way. I guarantee you they're going to start taking it and who's to order them not to. The other thing is we have here, if you're plunking all these trucks here, where's the security to these trucks? You're going to be bringing people into the neighborhoods that can break into stuff. There's no security that I've heard of on this site and even tonight they said there wasn't any. That's not very, I know it's not good for them, but it's not good for us bringing in some of those transient people that are willing to break into these trucks. Um, we just ask that you really check into this before you okay anything because this is going right into that field beside it that we see. Unless somebody corrects me and I'm wrong, it's pretty deceiving. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Mr. Tipping. Any further speakers on this issue? Going once, twice, three times. We'll take a motion to close the PPM. Call the question. Closing the vote, the motion carries five to zero. Okay, colleagues looking for speakers? Mm -hmm. Councillor Turner. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, so, quick comments. Um, the I, I Looks like the uh, the appropriate uh, setbacks are being employed here. Uh, the, the question about the 40 meters uh, is being addressed through. Uh, I mean, it, it's just a meter and a half extra that they have to do, but uh, they're going a little bit further. Um, the uh, I think through site plan it might make sense to take a look at the best location of uh, of the stormwater management. Uh, but if the concern is having stormwater in the adjacent properties, it might make more sense to have this stormwater management further away from the properties rather than directly adjacent to it. Um, so uh, I would leave that to the people who, who best understand those things. But uh, um, just to, at a quick glance and perspective, I think that makes sense. I mean, the objective of trying to create a further buffer from the, the adjacent properties does make sense if you can use the, the swim to do that. But um, 
I think probably the, the greater uh, intrusive behavior would be the in intrusivity of the water onto the adjacent properties rather than the extra uh, 12 meters of, uh, of landscaping that might have some sound mitigation but not a lot. Um, uh, Mr. Kirkness had mentioned uh, about encountering the, the question about setbacks for pavement. I think in this circumstance it's completely appropriate to have a setback for pavement because setbacks are meant to uh, set back the activity, the primary activity of a property from adjacent properties. And the primary activity of this is all the trucks that are going to be there on the pavement. So absolutely, it, it makes sense to have those setbacks there, and, and I think it, it's quite appropriate. Uh, overall, I think the application is appropriate. I'm, I'm willing to support it as it sits here. Um, is the uh, the site plan itself, would that come back as a public site pl plan, or is that uh, something that's uh, left to the site plan approval authority? Madam Chair, this is something that would be delegated to the site plan approval authority. We're not recommending the holding provision in this case. So in those circumstances, would it be appropriate for us to make the recommendations that uh, uh, that southern travel or tra access from the south isn't appropriate for this site and that uh, uh, that we suggest that the best location uh, for the stormwater management be explored to its greatest extent? Things like that or because I don't think it comes back to council at any point for those recommendations. Um, Madam Chair, I, I think that, you know, it's really in committee's hands. There's two ways to go. One would be you could um, apply a holding provision if you wanted to make sure that it came back to this committee and you, there was a, an opportunity for the public um, to uh, give comments uh, through that process of the lifting of the holding provision. Um, but uh, that that's one level on a spectrum. The other would be to... Uh, ask that the um, approval authority consider the following matters or address the following <coughs> matters. Um, and that's a little less strident, but uh, also would flag those issues. Uh, thank you, Sri, Madam Chair. That, that would be the, the course that I would think, uh, thinking that, that the approval authority consider these, uh, these considerations. And uh, we've heard from Mr. Tipping as well at, uh, uh, to those points. Um, and I think my colleagues may add to that as well. So, thanks. Thank you, Councillor. On the speaker's list, I've got Councillor Zaifman, Hopkins, then Helmer. Thank you, Madam Chair. And uh, I think from a perspective of, of zoning, you know, I think our staff have you know, outlined that, you know, obviously this is in the area of a lot of other similar zoning, so, you know, a change wouldn't be out of the question. I think that makes a lot of sense. And I can understand the applicant's interest in getting started uh, and moving on with the change in zoning. Um, but at the same time, uh, I would hope that, uh, and I think, Council or committee, as far as I've heard so far, is uh, understanding and willing to uh, uh, work and understand the concerns from the residents nearby this property, uh, and making sure that uh, anything going forward will hopefully help in mitigating uh, the issues addressed by the residents through their letter and speaking today, um, which I definitely have seen uh, firsthand. And um, you know, whether maybe something was done differently in the past, I hope that uh, any future developments in this area can help rectify uh, issues around both water um, as well as sound because those are issues which are very concerning on a daily basis to people in the area south of this property. Thanks. Thank you, Councillor. Uh, Councillor Hopkins. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. And I, I would agree with that, uh, taking into account the concerns expressed by Mr. Tipping, rep representing the community, should be taken into account when it comes to water and noise in particular. The other concern I have, too, is the road. If it is... Uh, can accommodate these transport trucks as well that was suggested. I would like to see if um, that is being looked at as well. The other thing I, I'd just like to um, bring to the committee's attention and maybe through uh, the chair to staff asking the question about the responses, uh, the, the notices, who received the notices in the community. Because when I read the recommendation, there were zero re uh, replies. I know we got this later, laid in, but Given the concerns in the community, I am um, just a little bit surprised that uh, if we were able to um, send out the notices in, in a certain, to a certain area, or if you could um, let, let us know uh, who received and how many people were notified. I'm just looking up that information now. The standard 120 meter radius was used, so it did catch some of the pro residential properties on the north side. Uh, but I can give you a bit more detailed answer in, in a moment. Councillor Helmer. Uh, 
Thank you. I wonder uh, first if our staff could clarify what the zoning is on the property that's to the southwest. I think that's the property that Mr. Tipping was talking about uh, also being under excavation and I just glanced at the zoning map and I wonder if our staff could just speak to that and clarify whether that's part of this application or not and what the zoning is. Madam Chair, on page 78 of the agenda, there's a, there's a zone map there. And uh, the properties immediate, immediately to the south of the subject one, and then the ones further south of that are, are all share the same LI6 zoning. Uh, the ones further down do have a, a holding provision requiring uh, H17 is typically for dry uses, but they all share that LI6 zoning, and which all permit that transport terminal use. Yeah, uh, perhaps I misheard Mr. Tipping, which is possible. Uh, it seemed to me like he was talking about the property that's sort of southwest from the subject site, which is on the other side of Castleton, not the ones that are directly south. No? no? no. Directly south. Okay, it sounds like I was wrong. That's no problem. Um, in terms of the, uh, the drainage issues and the stormwater management, I was glad to see such detailed comments from our staff in stormwater engineering. And I wonder if, if our staff who are here today could just speak to that feedback that was provided by stormwater engineering and how it's going to be incorporated into um, the plan and, and what will we consider at site plan. I know this is in the site plan meeting, but you know there's a lot of very detailed comments in there. Um, and, and I think a lot of them are addressing the direct concerns that people have about overland flows coming across the property, you know, impacts on adjacent properties. Um, and I wonder if our staff could just go through that. Mr. Yeoman? Through the chair, um, so development services uh, takes those comments on behalf of engineering and then submits them to planning services uh, in review of zoning applications. We'll continue to follow those uh, comments through the process to incorporate them into various other reviews or development agreements uh, to implement them. I don't really have specifics for you though at this time on that. Um, question for our transportation staff. There were some comments made about the condition of Castleton and I can imagine that this particular kind of use, you know, just looking at the site plan that's there uh, before us for servicing purposes, it looks like there's about 100 parking spots for trailers on this subject site. Uh, I imagine there's going to be trailers coming and going all day long, and so that's a lot of use. Um, if they're fully loaded, I imagine they can wear down. Even just looking at the aerial photography, you can see the kind of damage even in the parking lots uh, from that kind of truck activity. Um, so what kind of concerns, if any, do we have about Castleton and what are our plans for life cycle renewal on Castleton? Uh, through you, Madam Chair, um, I don't have information about the status of the road right now, uh, but um, I can get back to you with an answer um, just to see how this will impact. Um, in this case, I think through the site plan, we will ask for uh, a TIA, uh, so it will determine all the impacts, including the, the road itself. Uh, what can happen. The other thing that I need to mention is that this is within the MTO uh, zone, so they will be looking at this as well uh, when, when the site plan comes. Thanks. Um, I wonder if you could just explain to everyone, especially those listening who are interested in this topic, what the MTO zone means. So um, there are three zones that uh, extend about 800 meters uh, from 401 to the south and north, which is uh, the trip generation. So any, anything within that entire area near the 401, uh, it, it has to be reviewed by the Ministry of Transportation because it, is, it impacts their highway. So it's what, how, how many trips, how much traffic it will be, it's something that they look into. And they have also the building zone, so even, uh, I don't know the exact number here, I can, I can look while I'm doing this. Um, I can't see it here, but there is like, I think 200 meter or 400 meters building zone. Um, maybe it's within that, that, uh, that area. If there is any construction, they have to review it as well. 
And will the transportation impact assessment consider things like impact on Dingman Drive and traffic that might be coming along Highbury and then coming across Dingman rather than coming off the interchange from the 401? Will that be included in the TIA? Yes, absolutely. We, we always scope the, the work, the TIA, with the consultant or the engineer that is doing the work for the developer. So when they come, we will, will have to define the study area from where traffic will be. We look, and it has to be justified. And we, if we think uh, there are issues, we can, we can uh, ask them to uh, the traffic to be distributed. It, it's a management thing. We can ask them that they should come from the east or from the west based on, on the results, uh, the initial results. Thanks very much. Councilor Cassidy. Thank you. Um, so the, the residential settlement in this area, they've, they've endured a lot, we've heard from them. Um, so I, I want to ask staff, uh, what kind of delay would, would it cause to put a holding provision on? Madam Chair, a lot of times those holding provisions are removed at, at the speed of which the applicant goes. So the sooner they're ready to uh, remove the holding provisions, the sooner we can go. Uh, uh, so again, not, not too much delay. By the time the applicant is ready to go, there's probably one cycle of planning committee that we would have to miss. So just because of the timing, it'd probably be the next planning committee uh, meeting, but depending on what the nature of the holding provision is. Thank you. Um... So I want to talk about some of the things that Councillor Helmer was talking about, that the traffic, especially along Dingman Drive, is um, so I know that there are residential streets in the city where large trucks are not supposed to uh, use those roads. So are all the roads in this area okay for, for large truck traffic? Are they allowed or are they, co are they covered under any of those, the bylaw that limits the truck traffic? So through you, um, Madam Chair, t t I'm, I'm reviewing because uh, we do have a 24-hour uh, truck, uh, truck routes, and uh, I'm, I'm trying to see this here on the map just to give you um, the right answer here. It, so it unfortunately doesn't show if this is a truck route, but I, I think it's a truck route. Like Dingman is allowed um, to be a truck route, um, but I don't know about the other, route, the other routes. Sorry. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, so I, 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 I don't want to delay um, development or investment or anything like that, but given what has, has historically gone on in this area of the city and the concerns that the residents have raised, I would be willing to um, move for a public site plan um, for this particular development. Um, and I'm willing to hear what my colleagues have to say about that. Okay, uh, Councillor Zafman. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, in terms of whether a holding provision or not, um, you know, I think through the engineering design, which I hadn't seen prior to today, you know, there's definitely a lot of work going on there in terms of stormwater management, which is nice to see. So that's a great sign, I think, from the applicant, which is good. Um, you know, I think the main concern is that if there's an opportunity through whatever decision committee makes today to make sure that those things issues are addressed, I think that's sufficient, um, rather than delaying. You know, I, I don't think, you know, it seems like there's, it's on a good measure here. Um, I, did, um, I did have one concern, though, which I apologize, I forgot to uh, question or ask before. Um, my understanding, and, and I could be wrong here, but that the adjacent property to the east of the subject site is owned by, and I think uh, maybe uh, it was mentioned before, is owned by the same company, it would be an expansion of the existing site. And I wasn't sure just from the engineering design drawing um, where the access, if there's uh, continued access from the subject site going east onto the existing owner's subject site property uh, and where traffic might be going, if it might get filtered up to Roxborough Road or um, back out onto, well, or onto Castleton. I believe Mr. Kirkness has an answer for you. Uh, it's... Um Thank you, Councillor. It's to the northeast. It's not abutting to the east. It's to the northeast, where you see more trucks and buildings. Okay, looking for 
further speakers? Councillor Turner. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, I w wouldn't entertain uh, uh, holding provision put on this point. I, I think uh, uh, we have heard the concerns. Uh, they're addressed in uh, in the motion that's uh, that's up here now that talks about uh, uh, both the appropriate uh, placement of stormwater management. I think as uh, Councillor Helmer and Councillor Zaitlin uh, referred to in the stormwater engineering report, uh, it states the owner is required to provide lot grading and drainage plan that includes but not limited to minor major storm drainage flows that are generally contained within subject site bound boundaries and safely conveys all minor and major flows up to the 250 year storm uh, event. Um, and it's stamped by a professional engineer all to the satisfaction of the city engineer. That's some pretty strange <coughs> um, uh, conditions uh, and I think uh, they're quite acceptable. Um, I, I think as part of that, I mean, it's almost redundant to state that the most appropriate place is stormwater management, but that's going to be part and parcel of the, of the site review. Uh, it all gets incorporated here. So I, I think we can accomplish the, the same goal uh, just, uh, just through the uh, uh, request for the approval authority to consider these items. Thank you. Councillor Hopkins. Yeah, I, w I would agree with Councillor Turner that we can uh, make that all happen. The, the constraints are, or the conditions are uh, quite um, um, sort of set out already. I do... Um, you know, I am supportive of this application. I don't know where else a uh, transport terminal will, would go except in the 401 corridor. The, the location is ideal, but I do hear the concerns of the community, and they definitely should be addressed and can be through the authority approval. So uh, I, I don't know doing a holding provision. I think it just delays it a little bit. The, the end result will basically be the same, I think. Um, but definitely um, um, supportive of the uh, approval authority dealing with the uh, concerns. Okay, thank you. Looking for further speakers? Councillor Helmer? Um, I think I was just reviewing the uh, motion, and I think the other piece that I'd like to uh, tack on for the approval authority to consider is... Um, the extent of the vegetation, vegetation buffer along the south and, and east portions of the property. I think that's going to be important, especially in the longer term, you know, and it's sort of deadening the noise and how that's going to be handled between the interface between the rural settlement area and, and essentially the parking lot for the truck trailer. So, you know, I, I think that that might be another piece that could be added on, the vegetation buffer, on the, at least on the south and east um, edges of the property line, and that's something the site plan can work through, I'm sure. Mr. Kirkness and the applicant can figure something out that'll work. Great. The clerk has worked that into the motion. Councillor Zafin. Thank you, Madam Chair. And just uh, a final note for me, I'm just hoping uh, through you if maybe staff could just address um, for the community at large here that's concerned about this property what the next steps will be after a decision is made today just so that uh, a timeline and how these issues will be addressed going forward so that the community is kept uh, abreast of what's happening. Uh, Madam Chair, after this, uh, assuming there's a positive recommendation of the zone, uh, site plan approval would be next, which is a delegated approval authority. So uh, I'm understanding that there won't be a recommendation for a holding provision. So that'll be a delegated uh, approval authority with city staff, and, and, uh, and then I can pass it on to my colleagues from there. Through the chair, so yes, next it would have been proceed to the site plan process. Um, without a holding provision for a public site plan, though, there wouldn't be notification on this that would be submitted. Um, so um, that'd be something perhaps that you want to consider at this point. Madam Chair, I just wanted to follow up. Uh, our city map shows uh, Dingman, Roxborough, and Castleton all as truck routes. Anything further, colleagues? Oh, Councillor Hopkins? I just have a quick question on the uh, motion where it reads the restrictions with truck access from the south to be incorporated into the site. So not from the east? Are we talking from the south or should it be from the east? I just want to make sure we have the right I'm going to let Councillor Turner clarify that input. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. The, uh, uh, the south uh, um, is the access that would bring the truck routes right past the residential properties. So, so um, if it was coming from uh, Wellington up north and down Castleton, uh, then that, uh, or Castleton, then that would avoid the residential properties along Dingman. 
so that that's the reason for that recommendation. It would have to access the driveway on the uh, off of you know, Castleton, off the from the north. Is is the the purpose of the recommendation? Thank you for that. Anything further? Okay. Seeing none, we can call the question. After we get it moved and seconded, of course. Closing the vote, the motion carries five to zero. Okay, thank you, colleagues. On to agenda item number 10, uh, the delegation from the chair of EPAC, Mr. Levin. Welcome. Thank you, Madam Chair. I'm only here on uh, call your attention to items 9 and 11 on the ninth report of EPAC. Uh, you see before you the comments from the committee on the One River EA. Uh, we appreciate the uh, involvement from city staff and want to thank uh, Ms. Shear and her staff uh, for involving us and also to compliment you as well for the public meeting coming up in which you're explaining to folks what the, the city has already heard from the commenting agencies. A better informed public is always a better thing. Um, any questions on item nine or do you want me to just to mention quickly item 11? All right, thank you. Uh, Professor Moser, who's our representative to the master planning process, uh, decided not to come today. She'll be before you at a later date when uh, she sees uh, which comments from EPAC have come into the final draft of the master plan, which will be before uh, EPAC, I believe, at our next meeting or the following meeting. Any questions for Mr. Levin? Councillor Turner? Uh, thank you, Madam Chair, through you. Thank you, Mr. Levin, for coming today. Um, with respect to the uh, uh, One River uh, EA process, uh, is there anything from EPAC's perspective that's left outstanding and, or unaddressed that, uh, that this council should be uh, live to? I don't think so. Other than um, our understanding from staff who made the presentation is that there'll be some additional data gathered from uh, benthic invertebrate samples that have been taking over a longer period. Uh, EPAC at its, uh, a couple of years ago looked at uh, the period of time from the closing or the uh, malfunctioning of the dam to about 2012. So we'll look at the other information uh, from later dates but I would anticipate, you know, without seeing the data, that it'll just show a continued improvement uh, based on the benthics. Uh, thank you for the report. I guess I just want to make a comment to the chair or maybe to the clerk's department too. When I read these reports, and I do find them very interesting. I, I try to gather the information coming out of APAC, and I find them sometimes very difficult to, to um, read when there's not a, a, a map or um, a file number. Just sometimes I'm not very familiar with certain uh, um, topics or, or, or items that are, are mentioned, and I just want to see if I can just leave it with the clerk's office if there's a better way of just reporting the... Um, the items uh, to committee as it relates to mapping or uh, referring to an application number. Okay, any further speakers? Okay, seeing none, I want to thank uh, Mr. Levin and the rest of the committee for all the work that has gone into this particular report, in particular the One River EA. I think that's very sage advice, and thank you for all that work you've done. <clears throat> Beg pardon. And you, welcome. And we'll take a motion on that. Closing the vote, the motion carries five to zero. And on to agenda item number 11, um, application by Mainline Planning Services for a property at 6188 Colonel Talbot Road. We'll take a motion to open the PPM, please. Okay, 
can call the question. Oh, Councillor Hopkins. Closing the vote, the motion carries five to zero. Mr. Adima. Uh, good evening. Uh, this application is for 6188 Colonel Talbot Road, which you can see here. It's a agricultural parcel at the south end of town. You can see it on Colonel Talbot backing onto the Highway 401 corridor. Um, some information about the property. It's an 18.3 hectare site um, outside the urban growth boundary to the south. It's in an agricultural land use designation, um, the farmland place type in the London plan, and an agricultural AG2 zone. So it's clearly um, an agricultural parcel. The existing uses and um, this air photo we have here is not quite up to date. So since this was taken, they've established a hydroponic indoor mushroom farm. Um, which is located along their Colonel Talbot frontage. Um, and then the remaining portion of the site is agricultural, or um, field crops, I should say. Um, both uses are considered agricultural. Um, this slide I just included in here to show you some of the lot fabric in the area. Um, and I included this because some of the justification that was provided in support of the application um, indicated that while well, there has been lot fragmentation occurring in this area already, um, so I just want to acknowledge that yes, that's true, there has been lot fragmentation. As you can see, the large agricultural parcels um, no longer exist the way they probably once would have, um, but we need to understand that these are the result of planning decisions made under um, previous planning policies, um, most of them pre-annexation, and that the current planning policies are much um, more direct in their um, intent to protect agricultural uses in the long term. Uh, the nature of the application is to change the zoning from the standard AG2 zone to a special provision agricultural um, AG2 zone, as well as add a holding provision. So the special provisions would permit a reduced lot frontage and lot area on the site, which will facilitate the severance sketch, um, or a severance, and the sketch is what you see on the screen in front of you. Um, the official plan, both the 89 official plan and the London plan, require that any severance proposed for an agricultural use that does not comply with the zoning standards must come in for a full zoning bylaw amendment. Um, the H18 is being applied, or is recommended to be applied, um, to ensure that the properties are assessed for agricultural resources prior to site alteration or development. Um, typically, we would require the archaeological assessment, but because there's no actual development associated with this application, it's um, only to facilitate a severance. Um, the application of a holding provision was considered to be appropriate. Um, so I'd like to first go over the planning policies that are in effect um, and then do some or go over some of the planning analysis that we um, completed. So the policies that apply are the provincial policy statement as well as the 1989 official plan and the London plan, which as you know is approved but currently subject to appeal. Um, so first looking at the PPS, it says that lot creation in prime agricultural areas is discouraged and may only be permitted for um, there's a list of things that may, it may be permitted for. One of them is agricultural uses, which is where this um, lands. So for agricultural uses, provided that the lots are of a size appropriate for the type of agricultural use common in the area and are sufficiently large to maintain flexibility for future changes in the type or size of agricultural operation. So the key words in there are common in the area and flexibility for future changes. So we're not reviewing the severance on the basis of the existing agricultural use only, um, but for any potential future agricultural use to make sure we maintain some flexibility. Um, the guide, there's also guidelines on permitted uses in Ontario's prime agricultural areas, which is an OMAFRA publication. That's the Ontario uh, Ministry of Agriculture, Food and Rural Affairs. And it's intended to assist municipalities and approval authorities in how they interpret and apply the PPS language related to agricultural uses. Uh, so in that guideline document, it says that in general, the larger the farm parcel, the more adaptable it is to changing condition, 
or sorry, the, the larger the farm parcel, the more adaptable it is to changing conditions and the more efficient it is to run the farm. Keeping farms large enough to maintain flexibility is key to agricultural viability and to achieving the PPS requirement of protecting prime agricultural areas for long-term use in agriculture. Uh, so looking at the language in the PPS itself as well as this guideline document, uh, it's clear that it encourages retention of agricultural parcels and would discourage um, the type of severance that's um, being proposed here. Uh, looking at the London plan policies, it echoes that um, direction given in the PPS, as does the 1989 official plan. Um, some key policies or, or directions are that lot creation in the farmland place type is discouraged, um, and in fact, consolidation of land holdings is encouraged. So it recognizes that um, there's a 40 hectare minimum lot area, but that um, in, all, in a lot of cases, lots are below that size. So in those instances, it's desirable to um, consolidate lots to achieve the, that 40 hectare minimum lot size. Um, the, the London plan supports a pattern of agricultural land holdings that increases the viability of farm operations and avoids fragmentation of ownership. And as I mentioned, it um, includes a minimum lot size of 40 hectares for agricultural parcels. And when you think back to the PPS language that talks about flexibility for uses common in the area, in the London region, um, field crops, I would say, are, are the most common use. So we should be considering um, lot sizes appropriate for, for that sort of agricultural use. Uh, severances are permitted or may be considered for agricultural uses, um, but both parcels must be large enough to maintain flexibility for uses common in the area and um, should conform to all zoning requirements or a ZBA would be required. Uh, the 1989 official plan has a similar direction. It also discourages lot creation in agricultural areas and encourages consolidation of existing parcels. And it also includes that minimum lot size of 40 hectares. Uh, so now, um, turning more to the uh, planning analysis side, uh, wh what we concluded in our review is that the severance would contribute to fragmentation of agricultural land holdings and is not consistent with the goal of consolidating agricultural land holdings. Um, the severance would reduce flexibility and adaptability of the land for other agricultural uses common in the area and therefore reduces their long-term viability for agriculture. Uh, we acknowledge the existing 18 hectare lot is below the 40 hectare minimum, but it maintains more flexibility than two smaller lots would. Um, and again, the policies encourage consolidation. Um, so the final point here is that agricultural lot creation is discouraged. So all of our policy documents start off by saying agricultural lot creation is discouraged. Um, so therefore the standard we apply is that the application must clearly demonstrate that it meets the policy tests and um, in this case we don't feel that they've met those tests and um, have concluded that the application is not consistent with the PPS or the 1989 official plan or the London plan. Um, so therefore it's our recommendation that the application be refused and the rationale being that it's not consistent with the PPS with regards to agricultural lot creation. Um, it's not, it does not comply with the policies of the 1989 official plan um, related to lot creation in agricultural areas. It does not comply with the policies of the London plan. Um, and the requested amendment would facilitate the creation of parcels that are not of a suitable size for the type of agricultural uses common in the area and therefore do not maintain flexibility for future changes in the type or size of agricultural operations. Um, so that's my presentation. I'm happy for any questions. Thank you, Mr. Adima. Any technical questions at this point? Councillor Hopkins? Yes, thank you, Madam Chair. And I am, I'm not that familiar with the, the background of this application. So I understand it, it did go to Committee of Adjustments, and I just wanted to understand why it went there and what is it used for now, or where do we stand with this um, application? Um, through the chairs, the, the property was at the Committee of Adjustment. I believe it was at the end of 2015 or possibly early 2016. And that was to establish the, the current mushroom farm use. So it's an indoor hydroponic mushroom farm. Um, so through, through the Committee of Adjustment, uh, minor variants, we were able to approve that use and it was established. Um, so, and then the, your other question about the existing uses. 
Um, so there's a hydroponic mushroom farm on the front um, part of the site along Colonel Talbot Road, which would be within the 10 acre um, severed portion. And then the remaining approximately 14 hectares would be used for field crops. And if I may ask, are they growing mushrooms now on the property? Uh, my understanding is yes, they are. It is operational. Uh, Councillor Van Holst. Thank you very much, Madam Chair, for recognizing me. Last week, I had the opportunity to go on the fall farm tour with the Chamber of Commerce, and we visited a mushroom farm. It wasn't this one, but uh, I wish you could have been there. The, the owner was so innovative and, uh, and knowledgeable. He just captivated a, a crowd for uh, at least a half an hour talking about what was going on there. Very interesting. Um, I, these are pretty old policies. And uh, I think a lot of uh, thought has gone into agriculture since, um, since 1989. And uh, the idea of uh, intensive micro farming has become um, more of a thing, shall we say. So uh, for people to, um, to be able to deal with smaller, smaller lots where you're creating niche um, crops like, like this mushroom farm, um, is, po is, is possible, and I think we should have some of those in, um, in, in the city. So uh, because this site is fairly small, maybe it would be a good place to start. So I, I would actually support this just so we could see a movement toward that. I would like to ex us to experiment with um, the possibility of having smaller, smaller lots to see, uh, see who can see what people uh, can do with them because they would certainly be more attainable price-wise than a large 100, 100 acre acre um, property so th those are my comments i, I see um, i see the possibility for um, smaller lots being much more uh, flexible than the larger ones and and viable and i think we may have to rethink some of those older policies Thank you, Councillor. Looking for other speakers? Councillor Helmer? Uh, just a question before we get to hear from the uh, applicant. There's a comment on page 129 of the package about there being an Ontario cottage on the site that was demolished without a permit. And it was listed on the Inventory of Heritage Resources. I wonder if our staff could just speak to that. Um. Through the chair, the, so through the pre-application consultation, we identified that a heritage building had been removed without a permit, and um, one of the requirements was that a demolition permit be provided with the application, um, which it was. Um, maybe Jim can provide a little bit more information than that. Yeah, yeah there was um, a listed property was demolished before we knew that it was demolished. Um, and we don't have evidence of who demolished it. We just know that it, we have evidence of it being there and then not being there. Without being able to confirm how that happened, um, we signed off on the required clearance for demolition permit since it would have been very difficult to um, prove one way or the other what would happen what, what happened on that actual site and by whom okay, seeing no further technical questions would the applicant like to speak there's just a little uh, microphone next to you and you can just hit the button and introduce yourself Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, my name is Joseph Platino. I'm a professional planner. Um, 30 years experience, uh, two years of which I've spent at central, uh, as a central area planner at the Ministry of the Environment. So I'm familiar with, uh, with policy, uh, official plans, uh, as they pertain to um, um, direction uh, or uh, provincial interest and the application of um, uh, uh, policies such as the provincial policy statement to achieve uh, the goals of, of a ministry. Um, 
<clears throat> in my time, uh, in my 30 years, what we try to do is we try and look at the general intent and purpose of policy, and uh, we weigh it against uh, uh, the application um, so that we can determine whether there's going to be some kind of adverse impact or ultimately, at the end of the day, what are we trying to achieve? Um, as a means of background, since one of the councillors had mentioned uh, that they don't know the, the site, it's 6188 Colonel, Colonel Talbot Road. It's a 45-acre lot that is home to uh, farm employment use here in the city. In 2016, the Shogun Maitake Corporation uh, uh, constructed a multi-million dollar indoor hydroponic uh, farm facility designed to produce a rare mushroom crop. I do have some notes so that you don't have to. Uh, take them. Uh, would you like them? May I? Uh, so they produce a rare mushroom crop. Um, it's uh, originally grown in the mountains of Japan. Um, it's um, very difficult to harvest that mushroom, but this uh, a gentleman, um, the owner of the corporation, um, actually came up with, a, with an incredible process, an indoor hydroponic facility that works basically on recycled water and uh, a wood chip medium. So we're growing mushrooms uh, basically from a non-soil uh, environment, which is a traditional farm unit uh, most everywhere in Canada. If you were to have a mushroom farm in, uh, in London, it would be located here in an AG2 um, parcel. That parcel would likely be 100 acres or more. Um, it would require fertilizers and uh, you know, manures and that sort of thing uh, to make it grow. They don't smell great. This facility is completely enclosed within a 13, sorry, a 14,000 square foot uh, building. So it's agriculture industry at its finest. It's state of the art. Uh, it contains equipment that was conceived by the owners and um, has made them a foremost uh, producer of maitake mushrooms in the world. Um, the gentleman was courted by um, our client and uh, talked into coming to London uh, to a property that he owns. It happens to be 45 acres. Uh, this building at any given time, has well over 30,000 pounds of mushrooms growing actively. Um, it's completely contained, it's completely controlled, and it's basically farmed on a, a third of an acre, to give you an idea of what is needed here to be a viable and productive farm business. Um, it's also an employer. It has employees. It has uh, several people working there. The issue, though, is that after paying for the facility and everything else, uh, financing um, is only available for what he needs for now and for his future use. Ten acres is, uh, is the size that uh, would guarantee that this facility uh, uh, will, be, uh, will have the flexibility to grow and uh, at the end of the day prosper. Uh, and, and produce uh, mushrooms for a long time. So quite literally over the 10 acres, uh, the building could be expanded three or four times and produce an incredible harvest every year. Um, the planning report prepared by uh, Justin, and I say this with all due respect, um, um, I tried to scope the issues to keep this brief. I can agree that the main issue to consider when evaluating the proposed amendment is uh, agricultural lot creation. I can also agree that the Planning Act requires council to make decisions that are consistent with the provincial policy statements. And I can also agree that uh, provincial policy statement policy 2.3.1 applies to the long-term protection of agricultural lots. However, I, and I say this with all due respect, I think that the policy in this case is not being applied correctly to this site-specific circumstance. Um, my professional planning uh, opinion is based on the evidence at hand. Um, firstly, the policy uh, that we're relying on 
2.3.4.1a is not a prohibition on the creation of lots in a farm area. Uh, the PPS discourages it uh, only in the case that the lots are not uh, of a sufficient size to provide uh, for flexibility in traditional farm use, which, uh, but it does not, um, and, and, and to maintain flexibility for future changes, as, as Justin had said, um, in the type of operation over the long term. However, the policy uh, relies on the City of London through its official plan to clarify what that is. Uh, the policy at the province does not state that 100 acres is an appropriate size. It may be in London, it may not be, you know, in the Holland Marsh, where cash crop production can be done in a viable way in a very small parcel. And it certainly doesn't consider the fact that uh, we have technology now to produce 30,000 pounds more of mushrooms uh, at one time on a third of an acre of floor space in an indoor facility producing this stuff not during a growing season of a summer, but all year round. Um, so where other farms are fallow and not working, um, this farm is actually employing people and continuing all year round. The official plan, uh, the, the provincial government uh, requires councils to consider its policies, its direction, uh, the fact that Agricultural lands are a provincial interest. The fact that um, they must be sustainable, they must be allowed to exist um, and, and not be fragmented. But the official plan for the township, uh, for, the, for the city rather, has determined that a minimum 100 acre lot size is that parcel size. And it's basing that on, on history, on, on traditional farm units. It's not considering uh, what we're proposing here. So if a viable farm for field crops is to be 100 acres, the fact remains that this area has been bisected by provincial highways and major arterial roads uh, used to access Highway 401 and 402. Mr. Adima concedes in his report that the area was fragmented and the policies existed previously to permit um, rural, commercial, and industrial land uses that exist there today uh, as they were associated with the Ford Motor Company, uh, which is located literally down the road uh, from the site to the south. Our submissions um, included evidence that 95% of the area, uh, including the subject site, was subdivided into lots that are less than 100 acres. Um, about 65% of those parcels are less uh, than the size of the subject parcel being eight, um, 45 acres. And I think about 25 to 30% are in the order of about 10 to 15 acres or less. So what is the intent of provincial policy? If we read the PPS and the specific policy that's being discussed together with the official plan. It is my professional opinion that the intent of provincial policy is to discourage the creation of farm lots from parcels greater than 100 acres and re that result in smaller lots. So if I had a 200 acre parcel and I wanted to sever it into two 100 acre parcels, I wouldn't need an amendment to the zoning bylaw. I, there, there is no policy that discourages it. However, um, but although the intent of the par parcel is to discourage the further fragmentation of farm lots that are greater than 100 acres in size, and clearly not to cause existing smaller lots from being viable, I don't believe that that policy should be interpreted to not make these small parcels that exist and that are not 100 acres and that don't conform to the flexibility test and uh, the field crop production, um, you know, 
uh, the ability to do a bunch of different crops on a rotating basis, uh, they already don't qualify for that. So um, I think that the higher order policies of the city should be looked at. Um, the provincial, the Planning Act does state that all uh, development in the municipality should be sustainable economically. Um, and um, I believe that if you apply uh, 2.3.4.1a, then the idea is those three lots that exist in our neighborhood that are 100 acres shouldn't be fragmented to be less than that. Uh, we're not looking at a, a 100 acre parcel, we're looking at 45. The creation of a 10 acre parcel to guarantee the future of this mushroom farm that it stays and it's economically viable is, is, uh, is I think appropriate in this case. And the remaining 35 acre parcel, if it is not severed off, it'll be owned by the mushroom farm maybe if they, if they can afford to make that move and it will be held fallow from agricultural use. Uh, presently, the 45 acres, uh, historically it was used uh, to grow field crops, but together with about three or 400 acres of land under contract with the farmer. So the in general intent of the provincial policy is maintained because there is a contiguous parcel, although not uh, uh, within a, a property identification uh, number at a registry office. It is being used for that purpose. Um, so in conclusion, if, um, if we try to encourage um, uh, London's vision, uh, 11, I think it's policy 1181.7, and allow uh, parcels uh, that are flexible as farm practices and uh, management techniques evolve, then we will see that uh, smaller parcels like this ought to exist uh, to the benefit of the city. And if we do permit the, uh, the severance, then I think it's a win for the city of London and its citizens because uh, they'll secure the financial sustainability of this business and it'll remain in London as a contributing rate payer and employer It'll be a winner for the owner as he'll be able to complete the sale of his land, which has been left in abeyance until the severance is approved. And it'll be a win for the farming community as non-traditional cash crop operations ought to be considered on small farm parcels in a, an agricultural zone that are otherwise underutilized or rezoned for uh, residential, commercial or industrial uses that are not farm related. That's Thank you very much. Any technical questions of the applicant at this time? Councillor Hopkins? We have. Yeah. Hello, my name is Dan Lane. Oh, sorry, Hi. we've moved on to technical questions at this time. Do you have... Yeah. Okay, go ahead, sir. Yeah, hi, my name is Dan Lane. I'm the applicant. Uh, for the past 15 years, I've been assembling land in uh, the London area. Uh, this parcel is part of a 500 acre par uh, land assembly I've done. I've syndicated that land out to various different investors on, in the hopes of bringing employment and bringing jobs here to London. The properties there uh, traditionally uh, were cash crops. There's one farmer predominantly doing all the, crash uh, all the area, cash cropping it. Um, all the properties are rented out to him. So it's not, it's traditional farming because your policies are 27 years old with how you do the farming. And now we're looking at ways to create things and make it so we can do more viable. People have only used and let people rent these lands, developers, other people traditionally throughout Ontario because they get the farm tax savings. That's the only reason that area is being farmed like it is. It's not viable right now for somebody, a farmer in that area to buy 100 acres and farm it out himself. He just couldn't produce the amount of money to do that. I'm a farmer myself and uh, I understand how it works. The, the area there, predominantly we assembled this land because there are four interchanges. You're on two major highways, the 400 series highways. It's a unique area, especially from Decker 
to the for Wonderland uh, 401 and Colonel Talbot. Most of that land has been divided up. There is only one real farming operation on that in that in that in that area. The rest of the people there, it's either in industrial industry or they're renting it out to the cash croppers, waiting for development to come. So that's a little bit of why I've done that, why we did that, I bought that land, and why what we see happening in the future. The micro farming, the farming that's going to happen in the future is going to change. Your policies need some of them need to catch up with that change. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Uh, Madam, Chair, Madam Chair, if I could. Okay, two minutes. Because yes, you guys I, have been believe going me, on I bit. will. I represent Shogun Maitaki, and first of all, let me thank uh, this council and this committee for granting the variance in the zoning and allowing them to build this uh, highly technolog technological uh, facility. I think the planning issues have been addressed by not only staff but the uh, uh, mainline, and it essentially comes down to whether or not you believe, and we're not talking about severing this property for commercial or for residential or for industrial use, it's for an agricultural use. And agriculture, as Mr. Van Holt has spoken, is changing. Therefore, you don't have to grow agricultural products on open fields. You can grow them indoor, and more and more of those are being grown indoor. Now, Mr. Rodera uh, came here with the help of LEDC and the city and has invested over $5 million to build this facility. And he wants to grow the facility. He wants to create. The official opening was last week. He wants to perhaps build on this. But as you know, without a severed piece of land, you can't get financing. You can't grow. The alternative, if he can't grow and build and create more jobs, he will have to go elsewhere because he will essentially be shut out. So I think that there's been enough justification. The provincial policy statement says discourages. It doesn't say prohibit. The London plan or the official plan doesn't say prohibit. It leaves it up to the uh, planning committee as well as council to look at all the facts. I think that there is good reason to believe that this particular area is going to develop, maybe with agri-food uh, businesses, but as you need flexibility, and I think the official plan, the London plan, and the provincial policy statement speaks to flexibility, compatibility, sustainability. And so I think you can make this exception. And as Mr. Lane says, this is 10 acres within a 400-acre parcel, which is commonly held by a number, number of interested parties. So it's not only 10 acres of 45, but it's 10 acres of 400. And so I would respectfully request that uh, you grant this uh, severance. It's a site-specific severance, uh, but I would suggest that there may be an opportunity to, for you to look again at uh, the long-term vision of all of these lands between the 402 and 401 on Colonel Talbot Road to see how, in fact, you could have the wording and the agricultural policies fit the new way of farming and the new technologies that are available. Thank you very much. Thank you. Councillor Hopkins, Lynn Turner. And these may be technical questions for the applicant. Just a quick question, a uh, technical uh, question to the applicant. How many employees are um, presently on working on the side and, and what are the plans? if any. Presently, there are 13 employees working on site. Councillor Turner. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, through you, uh, I think for the property owner, actually, first, if I might. Um, uh, sir, you had uh, mentioned that uh, you had a land assembly of about 500 acres and uh, that you were renting off parts of the property and that others within the area rented off uh, parcels. Um, and, and it sounded like you were making a land assembly, perhaps in potential speculation of an expansion of the urban growth boundary at some point and a, a change from agricultural use into something else. Why is uh, continued rental of this property not, not a viable option? Well, if he owns a 45, there's no need for him to do it. He's already in agricultural use, so why would he want another farmer on the property at his facility? He'll, he'll be isolated. He doesn't want anyone on there if he owned the 45 acres. The only reason those other people I mentioned, 
that aren't farming it themselves are doing it is for a tax savings. It's the only reason they're farming there. It's not viable for anyone else. You put two interchanges there, you're going to rework Glamwork Drive. It's just for heavy equipment, big equipment for a farmer to be there isn't viable. And I'm talking from the Decker, the Wonderland, 401, and Colonel Talbot. Do you understand the answer? Okay. Right now, right now, everyone, prior prior to the the, the that um, building being being erected on the property, everyone rents out those lands in that area, myself included, to a, to a farmer, one farmer, to cash crop in order to get to pay 25% of the missile tax rate. It's the only reason why you do it. It's common across the whole province. Now that he is an agriculture use and built the building, he already has a farming number. He doesn't need to rent that out to anyone else, and why would he? He doesn't want anyone on the property. Thank you, if I may clarify, why, may, why is it not viable for him to continue to rent from you? Through you, Madam Chair. Why is it not viable? Because he wanted to get financing. The, the, the banks and the people won't give him financing. You have to remember, he's coming from Japan, so he has no real credit history. He has nothing to do with the banks. The banks, first thing they want to see is the ownership of the property. Uh, thank you. Okay. Well, I'll bring those points to comment a little later. Thank you. Any further questions at this time? Councillor Van Holst. Thank you, Madam Chair. And um, my question through perhaps uh, through to, to staff would be if uh, if the four a if the acre out of the four hectares of 10 acres is is severed um, what about access to the remaining property uh, through the chair there would be a 36 meter frontage to the remaining property so presumably access would be through that frontage on Colonel Talbot Road Okay, and then a uh, question to the applicant, um, just about who you who you supply. Is this, these are mushrooms just for London, or you're supplying outside of the city as well? Thank you. Um, as you know, Mr. Odera was exporting from Japan to uh, Northeast United States and uh, even parts of southwestern Ontario. Happy to report to you that since his, um, he started operating, he is now exporting to Boston, New York, uh, southwestern Ontario, uh, Vancouver, and hopes to uh, capitalize on, on uh, the popularity of, of, uh, of the mushroom. So he intends to expand. Uh, but um, but he is just, it is locally grown, it's organically grown, and therefore uh, it is in compliance with some of the other provincial policies with, with regards to agriculture and locally grown food and, and displacing some of those exports that uh, come from other countries. Okay, thank you. No further technical, oh, Count Councillor Cassidy. Thank you. Three to staff. Um, in the report, it says one of the reasons why we don't like to sever these these parcels into smaller parcels is because then there is the possibility that there could be two residential developments put one on each site. Is there any way to put a holding provision if we if we were to sever this lot so that we wouldn't allow a, a residential home to be built? Uh, through the chair, the. The, it would probably not be through a holding provision, but incorporating into the special provision that would be applied to one or both of the properties that would remove the farm dwelling um, from the list of permitted uses. And we'll go on to members of the public. If you'd like to speak on this issue, come to one of the microphones and state your name and address, please. Once again, if anybody has any comments on this, come down to a microphone. And seeing no folks running again to the microphone, we'll take a motion to close the PPM. We'll call the question.
closing the vote, the motion carries five to zero. Okay, committee looking for speakers, Councillor Hopkins. Yeah, I do have a question. Um, I, I assume it's to staff about the drainage. Any concerns there? Um, I did um, hear from a resident in the area that uh, drainage uh, is a concern of the wastewater, the wa uh, and uh, just wondering if you can respond. Uh, through the chair, so one of the comments received from the neighbors um, had to do, or part, part of the comment letter had to do with drainage, um, which was an existing uh, or ongoing issue. Um, that's not really part of this application. This application is dealing um, just with the severance. Um, I did forward those comments on to our bylaw enforcement um, people to have a look into whether they were in violation of anything, but um, um, that part of the of the comments did not pertain to the application. Further speakers, Councillor Turner. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I guess I'll just give some comments. Uh, I think the operation sounds like a great operation. It sounds uh, uh, it's very successful. I'm, I'm happy they've chosen here to uh, uh, to set up shop. Um, the uh, uh, it sounds innovative, and it's exactly the kind of business we want here. My challenge in all of this ultimately is the fact that, um, that provincial policy statements are official plan. I mean, the official plan itself is 1989, but uh, we've updated the London plan, and that's this year. It's contemporary. Well, the last year, it's contemporary. Uh, the provincial policy statements, 2014. These aren't old 25 or 28-year-old uh, policies. These are current, very contemporary policies, and I think they uh, they're rather clear, and uh, uh, I think they're further supported by uh, by OMAFRA's guidelines. Uh, I, I think uh, Mr. Adama uh, points that out quite well. Um, my challenge in all of this is the fact that uh, we see this repeating again and again, and, and it's, a, it's a big concern of mine, that a business model is predicated on relief from our rules, that, uh, that we have a, a rules, they're, they're, they're put out, they're rather clear expectations, that the, that's the point of an official plan, that's the point of, of communicating them broadly is so that when a business or an operation uh, or a development or whatever it is uh, can take a look and say, uh, this is the parameters under which we must operate. Uh, and, and we've seen a few times before this committee where the only way that it seems to be viable is to be able to be uh, not have to comply with the rules, that the rules can be changed uh, on a site-specific basis in order to accommodate that. In this circumstance, there seems to be alternatives and, uh, and viable opportunities for the business to continue operating uh, in such a way that, uh, um, I mean, one, uh, not having the capital cost of land and, and moving that into a, um, into a lease arrangement changes that cost into an operating arrangement. So uh, financing isn't really required. It becomes part of your overhead uh, as, uh, as part of the operation itself. I'm puzzled uh, if the operation was able to establish itself in the start and is contingent on having a, a property holding in its own right how it came to, to be established because right now it sounds like it's renting the property and then uh, it looks like the property owner is looking to uh, relieve himself of that parcel of 10 acres of that parcel so that he can say, okay, here you go and I'll continue with my land assembly and, uh, and go on from there. So, I mean, there's options. The, the, the parcel could be rented out, uh, or the larger parcel could be purchased by, uh, by the corporation itself and then rent out the remaining 35 acres. Difficult to do because it's not a large parcel for, for agricultural use. Uh, there are other parcels of, of 10 acre size throughout the city, however, not at agricultural prices. Um, the, there probably aren't a lot of 10-acre parcels out there for sale because for exactly this reason, we're trying to keep the assemblies uh, large uh, and uh, within that 100-acre uh, um, uh, construct. So I, I understand the objectives. Uh, I, I think um, we need to be able to do what we can in our policies to be able to encourage these things, but I don't see relief from policy uh, as the answer to that, I, I think we've taken a, a significant look at what our urban agricultural policies would look like. Uh, in fact, we're actually in the process of further developing our urban agricultural pro, uh, policies with consultants uh, to be able to tell us exactly how to do something like this on this scale uh, in, in a way that uh, doesn't offend the PPS. 
So I think it would be really challenging for us to kind of deviate from uh, the PPS. I think the PPS is appropriate. It's contemporary. Uh, it's not antiquated, as it's been alluded to. Uh, and, and I think even more so, it's, it's more contemporary now because we start to see uh, um, the further, uh, I guess, uh, uh, parceling of, of larger parcels. Uh, the intent is, as we start to see less and less farmland uh, being available, we, we want to discourage this as much as possible. Uh, so uh, I support the staff recommendation in this circumstance. Uh, I, I would encourage the applicant to take a look at, at operational ways of, uh, of meeting the objective. I, uh, I really would want to see everything that we can do to be able to support that, but I'm not supportive of the uh, uh, zoning change uh, or the severance request in this circumstance. Councillor Hopkins and looking for other speakers. Yes, um, I just want to, um, you know, make a comment that um, it, it, it's good to see farm operations and and uh, uh, happening uh, in this around the city of London. But the challenge I have is when we start changing the rules, we are creating almost a precedent when uh, um, other um, farmers can come and ask for severances, and they may be justified and have good reasons, like Councillor Van Hull says, maybe that is the future of agricultural land, but the reality is that we, once we um, start setting a precedent, it is going to create a problem, and I think it's really important that we, um, you know, um, stay with our existing um, bylaws and the PPS and the, and the London plan that that protects the, our agricultural land. I think that's very, very important. Um, I know th uh, that's why we have to keep the those larger lots, keeping that um, sprawling that can eventually happen uh, out out that way. And uh, I am supportive of the uh, recommendation of staff. Okay, I've got councillors Helmer, Cassidy, then Van Holst. Thank you. A couple of questions for our staff. Uh, the first one seems is about the timing. It looks like we're right up against the 120 days timeline. In fact, we might be past it by the time we get to council. I just want to confirm that. Uh, through the chair, the application was seen, received on June 22. Um, I've not done the math. Um, my second question, and the reason I'm asking about the non-decision timeline, is I don't see any comments from the Agricultural Advisory Committee. And I know that the Agricultural Advisory Committee exists to give this committee advice on agricultural related matters. And um, I, I have a question about generally why there aren't comments here and uh, to my colleagues and also to our staff, whether we think it's uh, worth referring it to the Agriculture Advisory Committee to get their input. I think I'm gonna save some of my comments until I hear from staff about that and also from my colleagues, but uh, I don't think this one is quite as straightforward as it might seem. Uh, through the chair, the application was circulated to the Agricultural Advisory Committee, both the notice of application and notice of public meeting. Um, I've not received any comments from them. Okay. Um, one thing I might suggest to my colleagues is that circulating something in the summer to farmers might not be the greatest time to get them to comment on it. <laughs> I know we have a number of active farmers who are on that committee, not everyone, but um, uh, that's interesting. Um, I, I do, I personally would like to get their input. I think that um, the folks on the Agricultural Advisory Committee are close uh, to the ground, uh, as it were, when it comes to farming. And uh, they've had some good comments on agricultural policies in the past. I know they commented on the London Plan uh, policies when we circulated them then. And uh, certainly they were supportive of those policies. Um, it looks like we're close to the timeline, so I'm not sure what we're risking by uh, circulating it and having it come back maybe one cycle later, but I'm interested to see if any of my colleagues think that's a good idea. Okay, just by the clerk's uh, quick math, you're at 118 days, if that's helpful to you. Yeah. 
Thank you. Um, I would definitely support a referral. Um, as Councillor Helmer uh, stated, I think that's a good idea. I might, <clears throat> uh, and before Councillor Helmer spoke, I thought it was going to be the odd person out on this one. So first of all, I just wanted to, um, to say what my understanding was on the reason behind this. And it, as Councillor Turner pointed out, there's a lease arrangement going on right now and everything seems to be working fine. And so it's just a, a cost of part of the overhead if everything is status quo. But what I understood from the applicant is that the, the, um, the, the person, the applicant is looking to expand operations. And in order to expand operations requires financing and in order to get financing is, is requires is required to be the landowner for his particular parcel. So that was my understanding, that in order to expand, which is what we want to encourage, we want to encourage expansion and investment of a, of a, of a successful business in the City of London, uh, they, they require ownership and they don't necessarily want to own the entire parcel. So I want to talk a little bit about rules. We have rules and we have policies. And we have bylaws, and we have provincial policy. But it's important that we not get so caught up in the rules themselves that they become completely inflexible. We have to look at the reason behind the rules. What goals are the rules trying to accomplish? And in this case, the rules are trying to accomplish the protection of land set aside for agricultural purposes. So here we have one parcel of, hand, of land that is for all intents and purposes divided up right now into two parcels, even though it's one owner. We have two parcels of land, therefore, one owner, two operators, both being used for agricultural purposes. Going forward, the land is expected to remain for agricultural purposes. I think we have to have the rules in place to avoid um, some of the things that took place in, in Councillor Hopkins ward earlier this year where people come in and start building homes on agricultural land and then we have the conflicts be, and, and then you have an innovative, again, small parcel of land farmer, agricultural person, come in and want to use that land for agricultural purposes. And all of a sudden, there's a huge conflict because now we have all this residential development on agricultural land. That's where the conflict comes in. Not necessarily because people are moving forward and doing innovative things and, and, and because of innovations, able to, um, able to have so much more yield from a smaller parcel of land. So... I would be um, supportive of the applicant's application, but I would want um, a special provision in place so that these parcels of land could not be developed for residential uses. I would want some sort of restriction in place that there that uh, that uh, doesn't allow those kind of conflicts in the future. These lands are agricultural now. They are operating as agricultural land. They're operating as agricultural land, even though they're smaller than what the provincial policy statement says they should be. So they're, you know, they're they're achieving what the goal, what the rules have, are, are, have set out to achieve, but yet they're they are they are they're not right in that norm of oh, it should be this large hundred acre parcel of land. So I, I I'm. I'm, ha I'm happy to hear what, uh, what everyone else has to say to that, um, but I would support the application going forward. And if, and if the staff recommendation is what is passed by committee, then I would, uh, I would speak again at council to see how the entire council feels. Thank you, Councillor. I've got Councillors Van Holst, Turner, and then Hopkins. Uh, thank you very much. Well, I would encourage uh, some more thought about this. So the referral is something I, I would I would recommend. Um, um, I I would just go forward th with this one as well uh, and uh, provide the re request for the zoning change. Um, and we talked about our business models um, needing relief. Uh, you know, if a business model needs relief from our rules to be successful, then we may have the wrong rules to make uh, business successful in, uh, in, in London. And uh, we should really think clearly about that. Um, I think also this falls into 
something I may have described before. I think there's four types of decisions. There's the, the foolish, unwise, wise, and brilliant. And um, the great thing about our, our, our corporation is they make wise decisions. We, never, we, we don't make, bring unwise or, or foolish um, propositions to the table. But going for the brilliant ones um, takes a bit of a stretch. And I think we may have that possibility in providing an opportunity for these smaller agricultural uh, properties. And the, the property in question is, is a perfect example of this. On 10 acres, we can employ people and be exporting. Right? That's what we want to be doing in London. We want London to be successful. We want to have businesses that are exporting and bringing money into the city. And if we can do that on this property, well, we can do that on the smaller property right beside it. And so let's, let's make those available and let's show that, show people out there in the world, in Japan, um, yes, please come here because we can make these available for you. And, uh, and we, we want to see this happening. Um, we're, uh, as, uh, as the councillor has said, we have um, a new urban agriculture uh, strategy. Uh, we've got a policy there. We're looking at very different, different ideas, and we need to continue to look at those uh, in other ways. I don't, I don't think that we should be risk-averse about, about precedent-setting. Right, as, as it was stated, that the, the policy says don't split up 100-acre um, properties. This is not a 100-acre property, so it really doesn't, doesn't apply. This is, it's a small one. This is one where we could, we could split this up and, and try this because I think it's going to, I think it would work great. Um, so I, I'm, I, I'll support this uh, as, as it is, um, and when it comes to council, I say we should just do this, but uh, if the committee's looking for a referral, uh, that's great. We might try to pass this on to the Food Policy Council as well for some comments as well, because the purpose of that organization is to look at our whole food system and, and see how that's l looking in London, and that's, that's also a, a group that has identified um, micro farming as as a viable opportunity for the future um, and if you've seen uh, if you've seen one of these farms I was in it perhaps this one was like it they had trays of mushrooms but they were um, they were stacked um, about 20 or 30 feet high so um, like our London plan that says we should build up and uh, instead of sprawling, that's what farming is doing as well. They're in their own operations, they're, they're building up as well. And so uh, we can look to that as the future, but I hope that we can be willing and uh, willing hosts to these, uh, these kind of operations. Thanks. Councillors Turner, then Hopkins. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, so, one, the question isn't so much a question of, of, of parceling out a uh, smaller than 100 acre. Uh, it's a question of uh, ensuring that the parcel uh, remains viable even after the, uh, the current uh, land users are, are no longer there. So, a 10 acre parcel of land becomes uh, much less viable as an agricultural use parcel should this uh, applicant not be there anymore. So that's, that's the big concern in this, right? Um, and then now we've got a remnant parcel that isn't productive at all. Uh, so, uh, I mean, uh, that's all completely dependent on, uh, on the, the viability of the business. The business could continue to operate uh, in perpetuum and, uh, uh, and then that land continues to be productive and that, that's not an issue or it goes the other way and uh, in which case then it, it is a challenge. Um, I, with uh, respect to, uh, to referral, I strongly, strongly discourage against that. Let's make a decision one way or the other. Let's let council figure that out. We've got the information on the, on the table. A referral, one would put, uh, put this past 120 days. Uh, when it lands at council, it'll be at 118 days and the decision will be made at that point. So I, I'd much rather council make the decision rather than the board. Um, and uh, the, uh, the second part, uh, is that if we want input on this component of the policy, if we want to, if we want to take a look and say, uh, is this a is this an avenue we want to pursue? Then yeah, let's let's seek that input from the agricultural advisory committee on the policy, not on this application. 
right? Uh, I think if we were to go and take a look and revisit the policy, we're looking at that as a whole. We're looking at it far more globally. Uh, and, uh, and as I said, we're starting to look at the urban agriculture strategy uh, in earnest, and we'll have some pretty strong recommendations that come back from, uh, from the group that's, uh, that's taking a look into that. Uh, so I just wanted to co comment on those. Uh, I encourage you to, to take your stand one side or the other on this rather than referring back. Uh, I think we have sufficient information here to make a decision. Okay, thank you, uh, Councillor Hopkins. Uh, thank you. I have a quick question and a comment to make, and the question is following up on a remark about our agricultural land uses and what they can be used for. And I understand, and I'd like to ask staff, agricultural land can only be used for agricultural land. We cannot change agricultural land and make it residential. Can we? Mr. Adima? Um, through the chair, um, according to the PPS as well as our own policies, within agricultural areas, there's only three permitted uses, and those are agricultural uses, um, agricultural related uses, so those are like your tractor dealerships and those sorts of things, and then on farm diversified uses. So um, large scale residential development would not be permitted in an agricultural area. Uh, thank you for that, and um, I think that's really important to know that changing an agricultural land use is very, very difficult. I don't think um, it's, it's easier said than done, and I, I think that's really important for us as a committee to understand that. And I appreciate Councillor Helmer's uh, comment about the larger farming community and getting input. I would love to get their input because it is a large farming area in that part of the uh, Ward 9, and it, it continues outside of the urban growth boundary all the way down to St. Thomas, and it's a thriving area. So if we could um, maybe at a later time ask the committee for uh, input on, on our policies, I think that would be worthwhile. I am not supportive of the referral. I would rather us as a council have, make the decision. I, I agree um, with Councillor Turner's comments about um, the viability of, of that small parcel becomes a concern. Right now, I think it's great the applicant's doing great work there, and, uh, and, and I, I encourage and, can, and, and support the work that's going on, but once that happens, that stops, uh, what happens to that smaller parcel of land becomes the greater question. Okay, uh, Councillor Cassidy. Thank you. Um, I just want to clarify one thing with staff. Uh, I can buy agricultural land and build a giant home on there and decide not to farm on that land. Is that not correct? Madam Chair, if the zoning permits a farm dwelling, then as long as it's interpreted to be a farm dwelling that is consistent with the zone, where that use is permitted. And, and has that not happened in the past where we have people living on agricultural land but not farming it and then now they're in an agricultural area and that tends to cause conflicts when that's their primary dwelling and they're not farmers. Uh, Madam Chair, that's entirely possible. I, I haven't followed up uh, with any, but chances are that would happen on a smaller parcel and not, a, a not on a larger parcel, but uh, it potentially could happen, yes. Thank you, Madam Chair, which is why I believe we need a special provision in there to prevent the smaller parcels from being developed or used as a residential zone, even though it's zoned agricultural. I just want to uh, say one thing about the viability, the future viability of these smaller parcels being used as agricultural land. I would have more concern about that, if this was not the second application in less than six months to come before this committee for a very small parcel of land and a farmer looking to operate an agricultural operation on that small parcel. So we, I believe we as a council and as a committee are seeing that, that this is what's happening. We are seeing, um, it's almost like a pushback uh, from the huge factory farming that has been taking place over the decades. Now we're seeing a, a return to these sort of uh, smaller operations. And as uh, Councillor Van Holst mentioned, 
This is actually a very efficient use of land. If I'm going to go by uh, what our planners are telling us all the time about that inward and upward, this is this is getting the most bang for your buck out of this out of this land and the kind of yields that they are getting from their uh, mushroom farm. So again, I. I I, I'm fine to either go with a referral or not. It doesn't look like there will be a referral. I would support the application. I would ask that there be a special provision put in place, but uh, I will just vote nay on the uh, rec on the uh, motion that's on the floor and, and then see how it goes at council next week. For, so from the chair, there hasn't been a referral moved yet. So if you'd like to move one, you're welcome to. My preference is, is to is to uh, accept the application, not refuse it. Any further speakers? Councillor Turner and Van Holst. I'd like to move the staff recommendation. All right, so the staff recommendation has been moved. Councillor Helm, pardon me, Van Holst. Thank you very much. Um, I would like to say two things. One is that um, the viability of this particular parcel um, you know, although it is only 10 acres, um, when you look at a certain 140,000 square feet or 14,000 square feet, there's $5 million worth of investment on there that can be used by, by, by other people. So there's a hybrid toponic operation has um, a great deal of high tech infrastructure. So it should be around for a long time. Uh, the other thing is that um, farm financing is, is challenging. Um, and so I, I, I take the, um, I take the point seriously that to, to get the proper financing, he needs to own it. Um, I used to do books and taxes for farmers for about five years. And uh, there was, uh, I remember one instance where I was in tears in someone's uh, um, living room uh, looking through their books. What they had done, they had a, a cattle operation and uh, because they were having some financial trouble, sold the cattle and decided to just... Um, just keep it for somebody else. But that made the difference in terms of their equity that they just ended up losing the whole, they lost the farm and I couldn't do anything about it. There was no, nothing I could think of to, to save them. So, um, you know, that's maybe a little melodramatic um, point to bring to council, but it is very important um, when getting financing what you own and what you don't own, and this will certainly strengthen that operation. And like I said before, if we're, uh, if we're a city that's, that's empowering these kinds of operations, we're going to see more of them. And uh, we could pit, fit another, another three of them on this, on this property. That would be exciting. So uh, thank you. Councillor Turner. I didn't have anything to say. I just Sorry, was did. it Councillor Helmer that has hand up? No? Okay. So we're through the speakers. It's been moved and seconded. We'll call the question. Closing the vote, the motion carries three to two. Thank you. So this will go to council next week. And on Sorry, I was wondering if we might make the second recommendation um, that, uh, yes. that uh, uh, we uh, we ask the agricultural advisory committee uh, for their input with respect to the uh, the parceling of lands, uh, agricultural lands, and uh, uh, maybe we can do that as additional business. Is that okay? Because we've already passed this. Yeah, yeah. passed that. But now it's. Uh, Sure. however you want to do it. Yeah, let's no, do it's it just thinking it's business. germane to this conversation. On to item number 12, a PPM for an application by E&E &E McLaughlin Limited for properties located 100, 335, 353 Kellogg Lane at 1063, 1080, 1097, 1127 Dundas Street and 1151 York Street. We'll take a motion to open the PPM. Thank you. It's been moved and seconded. We'll call the question. Councillor Hopkins. 
closing the vote, the motion carries five to zero. Mr. Corby. Okay, thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, as you mentioned, you listed all the addresses. I'll leave that alone for now. Um, the subject site, oh, my button's not working. Oh, there we go. Um, so here's a picture of the subject site and the surrounding properties that are part of the application. Um, the main portion of the site was formerly home of the Kellogg's factory. Um, we're located just east of the Western Fair District and uh, just outside of Old East Village. Um, on December 23rd, 2014, the plant was permanently closed and has remained vacant since. Uh, there's a current tenant in the property now, but the rest of it is still vacant. Uh, here's a look at the subject site within the surrounding context. Uh, we're looking southwest. You can see the Western Dare Fair District in the background and Old East Village on our right. Um, and there's some surrounding residential and light industrial uses in proximity to the site. So the nature of the application, the applicant is proposing the adaptive reuse of the existing industrial building. Um, they're seeking to provide multiple uses, which include a range of commercial, retail, restaurant, and entertainment type uses, and a potential hotel on the front of the property. So in order to do that, a wide range of zones, special provisions, and official plan amendments have been requested. Uh, they're seeking to recognize the existing site conditions and parking that was previously provided, uh, while providing a variety of uses that will help efficiently utilize the uh, existing building stock on the property. Staffs uh, feel the proposal is in conformity with the provincial policy statement. It's going to contribute to the vitality and regeneration of the city and the long-term economic prosperity of the community. Uh, we feel the proposal is transit supportive. It's going to activate the Dundas Street corridor, which is also identified as a rapid transit corridor. Um, it promotes intensification and redevelopment of the uh, area while creating employment opportunities, and it'll help reestablish a sense of place while redeveloping a historical and industrial site. So the first of the official plan amendments uh, is on the north portion of 100 Kellogg's Lane and 1097 and 1127 Dundas Street. Currently, the site's designated light industrial, and they're seeking to amend it to a Main Street commercial corridor. The Main Street commercial corridor designation is applied to long-established commercial areas, primarily along arterial roads and older parts of the city. Uh, this designation currently exists along the majority of Dundas Street, spanning from Maitland Street to the subject site. I've identified that in blue in the map below, and you can actually see it extends past the subject site almost to Highbury Road. Um, both the subject site and the McCormick site were industrial uses, and that's why it was stopped there previously. So we feel the proposed uh, Main Street Commercial Corridor is in keeping with the relevant official plan policies. It's a natural progression of the existing designation and provides a large mixed-use building along a main arterial road. It will provide a range of uses that would be considered compatible with adjacent land uses um, and creates an opportunity to provide for the enhanced pedestrian environment by activating the street frontage. For all the above mentioned reasons, staff is supportive of the change in the official plan to the Main Street Commercial Corridor on that north portion. As mentioned, several Chapter 10 amendments are also required. Um, this is due to the existing built form, um, the zoning and official plan de designations on the site, and the past uses uh, create a unique situa situation. Um, as mentioned, several of the lands identified on this application were previously used to provide parking for the Calgs factory. Um, and they're seeking Chapter 10 amendments to acknowledge this parking and add additional parking to support the future uses. So here's a map identifying where the existing parking is located along Kellogg's Lane, um, and then at 1080 Dundas Street, 1151 York Street, and 1097, 1127 Dundas Street, they're seeking to add additional accessory parking to support the future uses. The proposed Chapter 10 amendment ensures that these properties retain their long-term plan function by maintaining their existing designations. Uh, if the future uses at 100 Kellogg's Lane were to cease to exist, these sites would revert back to the underlying designation and zones and accessory parking would not be permitted. So basically the parking, uh, the way the Chapter 10 is written and the zoning bylaw will be written, that they're only allowed to be used in favor of the uses at 100 Kellogg's Lane. They can't be used just as parking lots or in favor of other properties in the area. This makes the site-specific policy appropriate to provide for the adaptive reuse of the existing facilities in place. Um, some of the other uh, Chapter 10 amendments that are required, the first ones to ad add additional uses to the properties. So the proposed Main Street Commercial Corridor is requesting the additional use of a self-storage establishment. Uh, this will be restricted to the basement floor of the building along Dundas Street. 
Um, in the light industrial lands at 100 Kellogg's Lane are recommended to add a self-storage establishment use and in office uses uh, in order to effectively use the vacant office and industrial space on the site. Another amendment required is to recognize existing office space in the building. So there's a ton of office space in those large facilities. So they're seeking to recognize the previously existing 8,361 square meters of office space over the ent entire property at 100 Kellogg's Lane. So here you can see where the permitted self-storage establishments will be permitted and then the office uses being permitted on the rear of the property. Just a quick note, the front portion already will be permitted office uses in the Main Street Commercial Quarter, so the whole site can have office. The proposed self-storage establishment use in the light industrial area is appropriate as warehouse uses and existing self-storage establishments are already permitted on the site. Um, a new self-storage establishment are permitted in areas transitioning away from industrial uses. So the McCormick area across the street has already gone through a secondary or an area plan, and this area is phasing away from the light industrial uses. Um, and this proposed rezoning and redesignation is just an illustration of this area transitioning away from industrial uses, making the uh, new self-storage establishment use appropriate. And due to the size of the existing facility, it is appropriate to recognize the existing office space on the site and permit the full range of office uses. This will provide opportunities to effectively reuse the existing purpose-built office space in the building. Um, the final Chapter 10 amendment that's required is to uh, permit the secondary uses that are permitted in the light industrial area. Um, there are existing policies that restrict secondary uses in light industrial zones when they're located within 300 meters of heavy industrial or general industrial zones and do not have access from arterial roads or primary collector roads. Um, in the case of this site, there is general industrial designation and zoning across the street to the north uh, in the old McCormick lands. However, the McCormick secondary plan removes the general industrial designation and replaces it with mixed use, commercial, and residential uses. This is echoed in the London plan that identifies uh, the Dundas Street portion is a rapid transit corridor and behind that a neighborhood place type. Um, so since the intent that is to no longer have general industrial uses within 300 meters of the site, um, it's a, and it will still have a frontage on an arterial road, it's appropriate to exempt uh, this property from those policies. So in order to implement all those chapter 10s uh, and the uh, official plan amendment, we have to do zoning amendments. So several amendments were applied to reflect the, those changes. Um, so the lands that have been identified for accessory parking through the chapter 10 amendments are recommended to maintain their existing zoning and simply add a special provision to implement accessory parking. So here's a map showing the lands that are gonna maintain their zoning um, and then they're adding special provisions on that existing zoning to to permit the accessory parking. Now the north portion of 100 Kellogg's Lane and 1097 and 1127 Dundas Street are being rezoned to a BDC zoning variation. Um, the BDC zone is most commonly used to implement the Main Street Commercial Corridor designation and staff has no objections to the requested zoning. Uh, the special provisions are required to implement, again, the Chapter 10 amendments. And here we can see the front portion being rezoned from light industrial zones to the business district commercial zones. And the special provision at 1097 and 1127 Dundas Street will allow for the accessory parking in favor of 100 Kellogg's Lane. And the north portion, like the chapter 10, will permit self-storage establishments and restrict it to the basement floor. It's gonna acknowledge the 15 meter height of the building um, and make a parking requirement of 400 parking spaces for the entirety of 100 Kellogg's Lane. And then it's also gonna recognize that office space at 8,361 square meters for the entire site. The south portion of the property is similar. However, it's a light industrial designation and it's changing from a light industrial zone to a variation of light industrial one, three, four, and five zones. Uh, the requested zones provide a wider range of uses on the site and are in conformity with the light industrial designation. Um, the special provisions that are going to be provided on the site, again, include additional permitted uses, uh, that is the self-storage establishment and offices, um, and again, permitting those secondary uses, uh, all in keeping with the Chapter 10 amendment proposed. Uh, zero meter setback for the north yard, west yard, and east side yard um, are all existing conditions. The north yard one's only made because of the new zone line across the property, and we have to acknowledge the change in the zone line with a zero meter setback. Again, the parking requirement will be 400, same as the north portion, and we're recognizing that office floor area. 
In terms of the London plan, the place types identified through the London plan are in keeping with the current official plan designations. The only difference is the lands along Dundas Street, which are identified as a rapid transit court in the London plan, and they're currently light industrial. Uh, through this application, though, we're making it Main Street Commercial Corridor, which is more in keeping with the London plan designation. And all those relevant uh, specific area policies that we'll be or recommending through this proposal will be carried over to the London plan if approved. Thank you. Thank you very much. Any technical questions at this time? Already seeing none, we can go and talk to the applicant if they, if they would like to speak. <clears throat> Uh, good evening. Uh, my name is Michelle Dorn Dornbush. I'm with Solinka Priamo, and we are the planning consulting firm acting on behalf of the uh, current owners, uh, Ian E. McLaughlin, uh, for this property. Um, for the past uh, six months, we've been working with uh, staff who have been very helpful through this uh, process, and we'd like to thank them uh, for their cooperation uh, through this, through the application and the proposal before you tonight. We've had an opportunity to review the staff report in detail, um, and we have no concerns with the proposals that are being brought forward, uh, and we ask that the committee uh, recommend approval of the official plan and zoning bylaw amendment uh, applications as, as they've been presented and outlined in the staff report. Uh, if you have any questions, I'd be happy to answer those for you. Any technical questions of the applicant at this time? Seeing none, we'll go to members of the public. If you have any comments on this, if you come up to a microphone and introduce yourself. Right yep, right. pick a microphone, any microphone, you're all good. There, it's high. <laughs> Hello everyone, uh, my name is Jen Pastorius. I manage the Old East Village BIA. Um, I want to thank you for the opportunity to speak to this project. On September the 14th, we held in conjunction with e, e and the City of London, we held a community consultation in which 87 people attended, which is a great turnout. People were very excited about the project. Uh, as it says in the report, 62 people provided comment. And the comments were overwhelmingly um, excitement about the project, about the phase one and what's being presented. Um, being a Silver Stacks Brewery and the factory, at, um, it's the activity center, is that, yeah? Indoor Adventure Park. Indoor Adventure Park, thank you, I got the expert right here. Um, and uh, and they were also, um, uh, you know, cautiously optimistic about the, the next steps moving forward, and so their comments really reflected that. So after each of our community consultations, we gather all the information up, we create a thematic analysis, and then we provide it back to the city and to the, to the developers for their use. Um, after that, we actually usually meet with the developers and the city as well, which we did. And we had a very productive meeting, and in that meeting, we actually addressed some of the concerns by the, commi uh, by the community, understanding that these concerns lived outside of the scope of the, the zoning amendment request. So we worked really closely with, uh, with the team and we were able to accomplish a friendly agreement between the BIA and, uh, and Annie McLaughlin and the other team members to continue a community consultation process moving forward throughout the next phases of the development in order to keep the community context uh, included in the conversation as well as ensuring that, um, that the developer got all the information they needed from the community to be fully supported. So I just wanted to to share that with you. I think uh, and we're very excited to, to work with this group as well as to see it develop over time. And I wanted to thank city staff as well for their ongoing supportive development in our area. And I look forward to the next steps in this, pro in this project. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Pastorius. Uh, looking for further speakers? Yeah, my name is Greg Gillies. I'm a resident uh, in the Old East Village. I have been for about five years, but I've worked for about 15 years um, in London and uh, on several projects in the Old East Village. Uh, thank you for the opportunity uh, to provide some input um, into this development. In general, I think this development is uh, an excellent opportunity for London to kickstart development in the East End. Um, I think it can be a keystone development um, if fully executed. Um, so I commend the developer for being bold and uh, and uh, venturing into this part of the city with uh, with a development such as this. My main concern is connectivity to the greater neighborhood because if we're optimistic like I am, 
this particular precinct to the north primarily and connecting back to the west through the Old East Village um, will be one of the great neighborhoods of London if, if handled properly. And I think we're on track to that, but each component will serve to um, in, make the other better. And at the end of the day, we have a, 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 an area that we can be proud of. So connectivity into the other areas to the north primarily along the main street, I think is uh, something that should really be studied carefully as this project uh, moves forward. Um, the other part of the development that I, I'm, I'm interested in is the courtyard, which I think is a really important part. And I'd like to know how in the long term that develop, that part of the, of the project would be um, accessed um, on a 24 hour basis by the public. So it doesn't become an island, um, an exclusive island in that part of the city. But otherwise I think it's a great development and uh, if the safeguards and uh, further uh, consultation um, as it unfolds is put in place, then I think we've got something uh, we can be proud of in the long run here. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Gillies. Uh, any further speakers? Going once, going twice, and three times we'll close the public participation meeting. Closing the vote, the motion carries five to zero. Okay, committee looking for speakers. Councillor Helmer. Well, thank you uh, for recognizing me, Chair, and obviously it's really exciting to have the planning application here. I want to commend uh, Enie McLaughlin for moving so quickly and also uh, for the direction that they're headed with the property. Obviously, this is a hugely important property uh, in the ward and in the entire city of London. And um, I'm really glad to see the direction things are headed. I want to start with that. And I think also the application itself is very good. I've heard um, some feedback from members of the community. I certainly went to the consultation and I would echo the comments that Jen Pastore has made, which is that people are very supportive in general. Um, I think they're very optimistic about how the overall area might redevelop as this site uh, redevelops. And, um, and they're interested to see it happen uh, quickly. You know, the, the, there's already activity on the site, I know, in the warehousing operation, uh, but there's also some other things in the works that they're hoping to bring forward uh, soon, and I think that's really very promising, and everyone is, is quite excited about that. It's obviously a very large property, and it's quite unique. Um, anybody who's ever been in it, especially once it was emptied out, uh, walking around, you get a real sense of the constraints that are there. And I also wanted to uh, commend the applicant for... I mean, they're basically retaining all of these buildings, you know, and I think it's very easy to, uh, well, I say very easy, easier to buy things, knock them over and build new stuff. And certainly we've dealt with a lot of those issues at a planning committee. And I don't want it to be lost uh, on anybody that what's being proposed here is to adaptive re reuse, you know, a million square feet of property, of trying to find new uses for it. Um, what's really being changed here is zoning and not a lot of the building footprints. And I think that that's really important that we recognize that. I think the example of uh, silver stacks coming into the old power plant uh, building into that courtyard, that's a really good example of what is possible if you think creatively and you recognize value and you see it. Uh, and then you try and figure out, you know, I'll put a warehousing operation in the back, but I'm gonna, we're gonna redevelop some of these other sites um, and when you look at the office space and you say this is perfectly good office space, we're not going to change it at all. We're going to renovate it and improve it and use it as office space. I, I think that's a really good example of what is possible in an industrial area that's transitioning to new uses. Um, I do think there's lots of opportunities for connectivity out to Dundas. I know that the existing building that fronts onto the street, you know, that's a big wall uh, and it, it, poses, it has some constraints there. Um, but there is that spur line that runs sort of mid-block or through the whole project. And I'm not sure once this site redevelops, um, perhaps the need for a spur line is, is lessened. I know this is an interconnection between CP and CN, uh, so I'm not sure that it's going to disappear entirely, the demand for it. But that, that northern corridor that's kind of mid-block, uh, perhaps there's an opportunity there uh, through site plan and other pieces as the site redevelops um, where there's an opportunity to connect things in there. I, I do want to hear from... Um, perhaps the applicant or um, 
uh, our staff about discussions about making sure that as much as, as is possible, it's really connected into the Dundas Street scape. I know there's talk about the pedestrian realm and the transit corridors, but making sure people can actually get through there and then they're not caught in what is a pretty large block, like it's about 300 meters, it's longer than 300 meters, uh, with not a lot of pedestrian access uh, except for Kellogg Lane and uh, Eleanor. Um, I wonder if our staff could speak to that because I do think that's an issue where the community is quite interested in how that's actually going to work, how people are going to be able to get through the site heading north uh, when they're not in a car. Thank you, uh, Councillor Hopkins. Uh, thank you. I, I'm just going to make a comment. Every time I see Kellogg's and this application come forward, I get... I, I'm always impressed how the applicant and the community and staff have worked together on such a, a large application. And the adaptive reuse of this whole area to me is really um, something that we should be applauding and the work uh, that everyone's done and, and the, the community being so involved and um, being listened to, I think is something that uh, is to me an ideal application. So thanks to the applicant and to staff and um, just really may, I'm envious. I may want to <laughs> move out to the old east one of these days. <laughs> Thank you, Councillor Hopkins. Uh, any further speakers on this? Alrighty, we'll call the question then. Oh, pardon me, Councillor Helmer. It may have been lost because I talked so much, but I did have a question about the connectivity out to the street. Madam Chair, you heard Jen Pistorius talk about uh, staff meeting with the applicant after the public consultation meeting. That's one of the issues we discussed. Uh, there's a couple challenges, uh, but not saying they aren't insurmountable, but I just want to identify the challenges. The uh, facade is, is fairly historic, and the intent is to one day designate that, and so altering it with new doors might be problematic, but I think we can overcome that. The other issue is the fact that the basement is above grade, and so it's, it's not right at street level, so that's another thing we'd have to overcome. And lastly, the road widening dedication for rapid transit is something we'd also uh, need to overcome. I don't think it was presented, but the applicants are proposing a fairly welcoming and large entryway into the northwest uh, part of this building, and so we didn't see that, but that was one of the ways to overcome that. If I could add just one more piece, and that is the parking lots on Kellogg Lane. Um, certainly, speaking with the applicant, working together to ensure that it's a decent pedestrian experience along Kellogg Lane, which is that connectivity that I believe the councillors speaking to you. Councillor Cassidy. Thanks. Um, and because we were still speaking, I decided to jump in. I just want to um, echo Councillor Hopkins, Councillor um, Helmer's excitement about the project. But I, I, I also want to say um, there's something about Old East. There's something about the, the community spirit there. Um, you see it with the McCormick's, you see it with Kellogg's, the kinds of, you know, it's been down and out in the past and the fact that the community is really coming together to shape their community. Not, it's not just going to be any kind of thing. It's not going to be a bunch of cinder block things all over the old east. It's going to be, um, taking old buildings like this, honoring them and making and keeping them a part of the community. And I, I think I think that's really great and it's really commendable and I just want to say congratulations. Okay, with nothing further, we can call the question. Playing the hokey pokey with motions, eh? All right, <laughs> <laughs> Alrighty, it's been moved and seconded. Call the question. Closing the vote, the motion carries five to zero. Okay, thank you everybody. Alrighty, so we'll circle back to the consent items and we can deal with um, number five, to application by Ryan O'Donnell property located at 581 Ross Street. All right, so take a motion on five. <laughs> Thank you, Councillors Cassidy and Turner. I'll call the question. Closing the vote, the motion carries five to zero. 
Okay, and uh, item number six, which is the Planning Services Work Program Update. Mr. Fleming. Madam Chair, I'll take uh, my lead from you as to how much depth uh, you, you would like me to go into here. Um, but uh, I will just give a very brief overview of why I'm bringing the report to you, and then I would take any questions that you might have. Um, it, it's a little bit of an unusual situation where we have a quarter of our planners it's in the City of London in our planning services area um, leave all within a fairly compressed time. And when I say leave, I mean leave from their positions as planners within uh, planning services. And so... Um, that, that's what's happening right now. Um, the good news is that all four of those planners are leaving to promotions, positive moves, um, two of them outside of the Corporation of the City of London, two of them inside the Corporation of the City of London. So these are things that you hope for, I think, as an administration, you want to see the uh, growth and development of, of your staff over time and see new opportunities arise and that they uh, are successful in achieving and um, striving towards those new positions. Uh, however, it's difficult when it all happens at once, and in this case, uh, to have four planners leave at the same time poses some difficulties in terms of our work program. So I thought it was a good idea for um, the sake of allowing council to know, as well as members of the community that we're engaged with on certain um, planning projects, that there will be some delays. And that is the purpose of the report. Um, these delays are project oriented. Um, while one of the positions does relate to Mr. Thomas in six area and in current planning, and that's uh, fish plan and zoning amendment applications, we're going to ensure that that's shored up. And so um, we'll make sure that the um, resources needed to get applications through as quickly as possible, at least to committee as, as quickly as possible, so you and council can have your uh, opportunity to make decisions. That will occur but that as well will take some resources away from uh, the projects that uh, you're, you see in the report. Um, as you know, we have a fairly aggressive work program with a lot of items on there. They're project-based. We're often engaged with community, um, the development community, um, special interest groups, other levels of government. So just important that we let everybody know this is where we're at and we do expect some delays. Um, I've highlighted in the report uh, Four that are on council strategic plan, and you can see them on page uh, 27, 28 of your agenda. It's the green development strategy, the Lambeth Community Improvement Plan, the Boulevard Tree Bylaw Revisions, and the Urban Design Service Review. Um, and there are others as well that are noted in the report um, in the appendix. You can see all of the projects that we're engaged in and um, where some of those are expected to be delayed based on the, these uh, resource um, changes. Uh, I've also identified that there's some pressures that are coming from another uh, couple of sources. One relates to the uh, tree, new tree protection bylaw. As you'll recall, when we came to council, uh, we did bump up our resources in urban forestry, but they were commensurate with what we expected by way of um, a tree protection bylaw and the caliper of tree or the diameter of tree that would be covered by a bylaw. And by reducing the size of or the diameter of the tree that would be covered, it meant that there are more trees that need to be addressed through the bylaw. And that means um, inquiries, it means applications, it means processing those applications, it means enforcement, um, and in some cases doing hearings. So we have now about a year underneath us uh, from the bylaw. We said we'd come back. So I will be coming back with a report. And in that report, I'll be identifying, here's the activity going along with the tree protection bylaw. Um, here's the um, uh, result on the work program uh, to date and what we would expect going forward. And here are some options. And the options would generally be uh, you could go back to a different diameter for the bylaw. You could um, <laughs> delay your, your work program um, or you could increase the complement of, of urban forestry technologists that are working on the bylaw. But I don't think that's a conversation, respectfully, that, that we should have today. I think the more detailed report would be the time that you'd be addressing it. I'll get that to you before uh, your budget deliberations. And finally, um, we've had uh, an inordinate number of, uh, relative to our past experiences of um, 
heritage alteration permit applications and heritage impact assessment evaluations. And these are things that Mr. Yanchula and his team have been dealing with. And we just wanted to point out that um, this, this makes sense. This goes along with um, heritage conservation districts and um, more properties being covered by those. Um, we've introduced a streamlining process, which is a deferral of um, some of the, um, sorry, not deferral, but uh, delegation of some of the heritage alteration permit um, application evaluations going to the city planner, not having to come here, which has sped things up. Um, but w again, we can report on that in some detail. We would be doing that, I believe, through a uh, through the budget process. We've already been talking to uh, my colleagues at SLT as well as um, finance, and that would probably be through assessment growth. So that's something that, again, I think is a discussion for later. And then um, that has had impact, as you'll see, on the uh, work program. So I'm trying to be very transparent and open about our work program, keeping everybody informed as to where we're at, and glad to take any questions that uh, the committee may have. Councillor Cassidy and then Hopkins. Thank you. Um, so my first question is about the heritage alteration permits. So um, roughly how many what did we did, have we processed between January and August? It says that it was equal to the entire year of last year. And was last year a typical year? Um, and also, is, is this based on what you, through you, Madam Chair, what you said, Mr. Fleming, is this an upward trend? Or are we going to see this increasing as we go forward? I'm confident we're going to see it increasing as we go forward um, because of the volume of heritage properties that, that we have um, coming on stream and already in the city. Um, we met our target from last year just at the end of August this year, and I am conscious to not have the wrong number to say, so it's in the order of 100. So that's what I recall, but I don't have the figure in front of me. And that's just heritage alteration permits. That has nothing to do with any of the other activities that are also involved in the assessment of planning applications or heritage applications under either the Planning Act or the Heritage Act. Thank you. And would that have been a typical year last year, about 100? Uh, yes, it was typical for last year, but it's ascendant. We've done, we've done a... Uh, uh, a graph of where we've gone and the projection is almost a straight line up so there is no typical year anymore unfortunately thank you uh, so I'm um, now my my next questions are all uh, in appendix a I just want to make one comment on the first page of, of uh, appendix a it says uh, safe injection sites and I just want to point that out that supervised injection sites was the term Dr. Mackey was here a while or at Community and Protective Services a while ago and 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 the newer term is even supervised consumption sites. I just want to point that out. Um, I have a question about um, page five of Appendix A, Kaleli Fields. Can you tell me exactly where that is? Certainly through the chair. Uh, it's an area of land that's uh, on Adelaide Street north of Windermere. Um, it's been um, used for farming for the last, hmm, I can't, forever. Um, it was the subject of a, uh, a larger planning study some 15 years ago that looked at the limits of the Clayley ESA and did identify those lands as future need for recreation services. So we're now working with Parks and Rec uh, um, at looking at those fields. The timing is right to be developing those for uh, full-size cricket pitch and some baseball diamonds to service needs across the city where we're losing baseball diamonds and accommodating uh, growth in new sports areas. So we're just starting to look at the design for that. Thank you, uh, Mr. McPherson. And that's what I thought it was. I just wanted to make sure. Um, so in, in, the, in the report, it says... Uh, Delayed is a lower priority. So I know we're losing ball diamonds in other parts of the city. Will this delay exacerbate that situation? Will we? Are we still going to be on track to to take up the slack from when we lose those other ball diamonds? Do you think? Uh, excellent question. Um, yes, we will. Slightly delayed from when we hope to do it. 
Uh, but of course, with infrastructure funding coming in the door, we want to get those projects finished. So um, we are watching that closely and trying to get a terms of reference out the door in the next month to start that one. Okay, thanks. Councillor Hopkins. Uh, thank you, and um, I'm looking forward to that report on the tree bylaw coming forward. So. Uh, I guess uh, we'll wait for that conversation, but uh, given that it's been one year, it would be quite interesting to see uh, how effective that's been and, and uh, the need to implement the, uh, the new tree bylaw. The question I have is around uh, the, uh, the projected timelines with the four items that are part of our strategic plan, as well as the other items in Appendix A, the delayed items. And and I, you've given date uh, timelines that ha have been just deferred. How confident are you that you'll be able to make those um, timelines, given the uh, stress that you have in the department? Well, Madam Chair, I, I think we're in a, a good position. From a resource point of view, I think we're fine. For planners, I think we just need to hire um, to replace what we've lost. So I just want to make that point clear that I don't think there's a need for any additional planners. Um, I th think that any work program has to have some flex to it and we do our best. And you can see how many items we're dealing with here and recognizing that there's complicated processes behind many of them, including the most complicated thing, which is individuals. So we're dealing with uh, uh, neighborhoods and the engagement process we're dealing with the development community often we're dealing with um, other departments city hall so we're working through a lot of issues and that that means that the, uh, there is some flux um, that you can expect in terms of the timelines we can't be as precise if we were dealing with something that was much more mechanical by way of a process and um, with uh, um, clear outcomes and in some cases those outcomes evolve and the milestones change slightly. So our commitment is to report back to you on a regular basis, which we've done in the past, to give you our targets, to pursue those targets aggressively. Um, we do know that in the case of hiring staff, uh, it takes time to ramp people up and particularly when you have four people retiring at the same time. And I should say, incidentally, although it's not covered here, um, development services also has had um, uh, staff member again move up which is great um, but it means that they have to fill that resource so we're collaborating we're working together through the hiring process to uh, uh, find planners that can best meet the different roles that we need them for um, but it takes time to ramp up so uh, we're fairly confident they should be seen as targets um, but again we're taking very seriously from a project management point of view we have project charters and um, we have milestones and we're driving towards meeting timelines. Already Councillor Helmer. Uh, how long do you think uh, through the chair it'll be until you're back out to full complement? I would guess uh, and it, it is a guess, but four to six months before we have everybody in place, we will have somebody in place we know within about a month's time. Um, but uh, what we want to be clear on is it's important we don't just fill the spaces. It's important that we build a great team to complement our existing great teams. And so getting the right people is, I think, uh, probably more important than one or two months uh, quicker um, and just taking um, you know, somebody that we don't think is going to be a, a really good fit or has all the capacities that we're looking for to fill the job. Uh, so thank you and I hope you don't think I was suggesting you do that. Um, I'm sure there'll be lots of people interested in working for planning services at the City of London. It seems to be a great place to work and the team does amazing work and I'm sure one of the things that will attract people is that we complete projects on time and that there's lots of stuff going on. So um, speaking of that I wanted to talk about the engagement improvements phase two. So can we just have a little recap about what the initial timeline was for the engagement improvements? This is something that I think is a really big step forward and underpins all the other work that's going on and especially in current planning uh, and how people engage with the city uh, around planning matters and so I, I, I 
consider it to be a very important project. I see it as one of the very few projects that are being delayed outside of the timeline in the council strategic plan. And I, I just want our staff to speak to it about the original timeline and, and the delay. Uh, Madam Chair, the, the, uh, originally the timeline was scheduled for, I believe it was Q2 of this year. And, and at that time we presented a report in, to PEC and got endorsement for that project. The, uh, the issue now is just making it happen, the implementation, getting, um, uh, getting the websites operational, signing the contract with the sign manufacturer, just, th just those operational things that are in the motion right now. Uh, my staff member and I are talking about a November 2017 implementation date, so uh, we're getting close to that, and that's the target we're looking to achieve to get a sign in the ground and, and the websites operational. That sounds like you're speaking to engagement, new signage reports, notices, web. There's a separate line in the work plan for engagement improvements phase two. And it doesn't start until next year, and then it goes for a year and longer. Uh, Madam Chair, the, the intent of phase two was to consider expanding the notification radius area. Um, just trying to think off the top of my head now. With... Sorry, one moment here. So it, it was to expand the, the notification area. It was also to consider uh, protocols for community information meetings. Right now, there's there's no protocol. Some people do open houses. Some people have presentations. So uh, that was part of the phase two. Um, and, and I'm sorry, did I, is that what you were asking? Was what the project involved? That's what it was. Yes. Thank you. That is what I was asking about. And. Um, the original timeline for that, if I just remember without having pulled up the previous report, was you know, we dealt with it in the summer, and I, my expectation at that time was that over the summer some of these things would start happening. I certainly understand the resource constraint, but um, what's before us here is that nothing's going to start happening on that front until December, and then it's going to go on for more than a year. And I, I, some of those things sound like they would take quite a while. Some of them sound like they would not take very much time. So I wonder uh, if you could be a bit more specific <coughs> about what might be happening at the beginning of next year and what might be happening later on. So at the beginning of this year, we're going to be doing the research into some of the, the uh, phase two initiatives. Some of them will require, for example, legal opinions, um, costing implications, for, for example, of expanding the radius area. Um, and, and so it's that research bit. It will probably use the same format where we present to you our research and, and uh, seek direction or, or endorsement of the strategy and then look forward to implementing it. Okay, so I went from a little bit concerned to very concerned. Um, so, uh, you know, we already dealt with uh, we already dealt with this issue in the summer, and uh, I'm not exactly sure what's going to come forward until I guess it comes forward. But uh, expanding the notification radius is pretty important to me. I went through a council. Um, I don't really like the idea of waiting around, um, and I know there's a lot of important projects on here. The the uh, I'm just going to leave it there for now. I'm going to think about it between now in council. Um, the other one is the uh, Boulevard Tree bylaw revisions. This is another one that um, has been on the docket for a while. I remember dealing with it. It seems like a really long time ago. I'm sure it wasn't that long ago, maybe two years ago. Uh, and I thought it was going to come back pretty soon. And then I remember we had the you know, delay, and I understand why. We had a lot of stuff going on and uh, a lot of projects, frankly, in, in that area. Um, it was pushed back a bit, and now it seems to be pushed back again. And uh, this is one of these ones around protecting more, right? Part of the reform strategy where, you know, putting the protections in place earlier seems like a lot better idea than later. And that there's a cost to delaying, which is, you know, trees get cut down or people do things to blow our trees that injure them and it causes problems. So in particular around the costing and the appraisal of the trees, like this is part of the issue we were dealing with when it came forward. Um, I'm very concerned about waiting, and I wonder if our staff could speak to that one. I know that it's, you know, it's a fair amount of policy work to get it right, and certainly I imagine our experience with the other tree protection bylaw is like, okay, there's resource implications too when we make these changes, but I want to make sure that, you know, the delay is really justified and that the impact of that delay is not so big that we shouldn't be reprioritizing or deprioritizing other things. Madam Chair, I think this is an important one, and as the committee would know, we've already come forward with a report with recommendation, and uh, 
were sent back, and there's a couple of complicating factors. One is the tree protection bylaw overall that we've been talking about. This is one of the projects that suffered as a result of the resources being directed towards the implementation of that bylaw. Um, the second element that's complicating here is this is not just about that evaluation. So that was a big part of it is let's truly evaluate what a boulevard tree is worth so that if you're removing the boulevard tree, you're not just paying for the cost of the removal. In other words, what's the cost to cut it down? But you're also paying essentially uh, for the true value of that tree to the neighborhood, the, the residents that are surrounding it, and to the community as a whole, and all of our targets around um, canopy. Um, but then there's another piece, which was uh, the request that we look at the ability for the public to plant trees on the boulevard. Um, how does that work within the context of a lot of issues that have been raised by our operations folks, uh, as well as our urban forestry planning folks around the way that people plant, planting correctly, planting the right species, the right tree in the right place. Uh, some of the safety issues, we know that large trees, when they're not, when they grow to be large trees, if they're not planted properly, can actually create hazards. We know that when they're in the wrong place, for example, obstructing view corridors on streets, stop signs, those sorts of things can create problems. Then there's the whole fruit tree, nut tree, food tree uh, issue. So there's a lot of factors at play here. Um, we know it's an important one, and that's why, regardless of some of the constraints, we're putting at Q2 2018. Uh, I don't know through you, Madam Chair, whether Mr. McPherson might have anything to add. I'm seeing a no. Uh, anything further, Councillor Helmer? Yeah, go ahead. This is a more general question. It says in the recommendation that the uh, strategic plan dashboard be updated accordingly. And is that just adjusting the expected timelines for completion? It's not about adjusting the original timelines, right? So Madam Chair, um, it, it would be, um, my understanding is there's the variance piece where we would be describing that and uh, there is the expected date. So. While the original date might not change, the expected date uh, would change. And that is, that's a little bit different than the variance column, just so we're talking about the same thing. That's only allowed where you go to, um, forward to committee and council with a report that says here's the new expected date. Councillor Turner. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, through you, just uh, with respect to the Urban Design Service Review itself, uh, one of the, the key delays identified is the uh, stakeholder concerns themselves. Um, I, I think also you, you bring it out in this report so that identifies there's resource concerns as well. Uh, what, uh, what's required to, to put focus and get that on track? So, Madam Chair, um, the intent of this is to review the service, urban design service, and it's been about 10 years since it first uh, was put in place. I think what we under want to understand is what's going well, what's not going well, continuing to do what's working and to change what's uh, not working well. And uh, we want to look at it from a customer service point of view, from an efficiency point of view and from an effectiveness point of view, are we actually having meaningful impact on the quality of urban design in the city? Um, we are not suggesting that there's any resource concerns or considerations <coughs> here or needs. Um, more so, we're looking at our processes and what are the outcomes of our urban design program. Um, of course, there's a lot of um, input that's required by way of um, our partners and so partners include internally development services for example engineering services uh, in the community uh, the development community is a big part of who we need to work with on this but there's also the larger community neighborhoods and um, the urban league and others so that's the purpose of the project that's how it's to be done what we've done so far is we've prepared a charter we prepared a terms of reference um, which embedded itself into a request for proposals. We went out to see who would uh, work with us on this project. Um, we've received those proposals and we're kind of stuck there right now. So um, I don't have a specific date that can, I, I can provide you at this time. Um, I'm working together with uh, a number of, of others, including the city manager on this one. Um, but we would like to get rolling on it so that we can 
um, address uh, some of the concerns around the urban design. Um, and those concerns come in, as I said, different forms from efficiency, but also an effectiveness perspective. Any further speakers on this? Okay. Seeing none, we can take a motion to receive. Okay, moved and seconded. Call the question. Closing the vote, the motion carries five to zero. Okay, and we'll move down to items for direction, a staff report for a property located at 2054 Adelaide Street North. Good evening, Ms. Posado. The subject site is 2054 Adelaide Street North. Uh, it is a 21 hectare. Let's pause one moment, sorry. Mm. Councillor Helmer. Would have been a long pause. Thanks for turning off the mic. <laughs> um, I, I'm just going to raise it in case my colleagues are interested. Could we perhaps maybe take a five minute break before we get underway? I know it's the last item, right. but maybe a five minute break would help everyone. Moved by Councillor Helmer, seconded by Councillor. Cassidy and Hopkins and everybody else. We'll just take a five minute recess. Sorry, Ms. Pisato. Thank you.
All right, everyone, we'll call the meeting back to order. Oh, Mr. Yeoman. Uh, if I could, through you, Madam Chair, what we have before you here tonight um, is a, a recommendation for advice to the Ontario Municipal Board on a settlement for uh, the subdivision that you have, formerly known as the Comfort Lands um, off of Adelaide. Ms. Posado does have a uh, presentation she could provide to you. Uh, the applicant is here tonight as well. The applicant's in concurrence with the, the uh, this information that's before you today. So we take committee's uh, suggestion or, or perspective on whether you'd like to hear this or whether you'd like to just uh, ask questions to, to staff. I'll look to committee. I'd like to hear it. Like to hear it. Okay, we'll hear the presentation, please, Ms. Posado. Through you, Madam Chair. The subject site is 21 hectares in size and is located um, east of Adelaide Street, uh, north of Sunningdale Road and adjacent to the municipal boundary. <clears throat> the site contains a potentially potential environmentally significant area and a provincially significant wetland. The lands directly abutting to the north are within the municipality of Middlesex Center and are designated as agriculture and open space and are being used for cash crops. The existing Sun Canadian pipeline runs along the entire north limit of this site. The original application consisted of 14 low density residential blocks, several medium density blocks, several open space and walkway blocks, as well as one future road block, all served by several new roads. Staff ultimately recommended at the time a red line draft plan of subdivision. The red lines were associated with a revised development limit that was recommended by staff at the time, based on a maximum buffer associated with those natural heritage features. <clears throat> On September 9th, 2014, a public meeting was held and PEC uh, recommended approval of the official plan and zoning bylaw amendments and recommended that the approval authority draft approve the redlined plan of subdivision as proposed by staff. This was supported by Municipal Council. On October 16th, an appeal was received by the Ontario Municipal Board for the OPA and ZBA. Both appeals were made by the owner, applicant, Peter Sergatis, Sherway Limited, also the numbered company that's been mentioned in the report. The basis of the, of the appeal was the environmental setbacks and mapping are incorrect. Conditions of draft approval are unreasonable and will interfere with the orderly and economic development of the subject lands and access to publicly funded and available municipal services on municipal road allowances are restricted. The applicant subsequently appealed a lack of decision on the draft plan of subdivision in July of 2016 and asked the OMB to consolidate all the appeals. <clears throat> Since the appeals, the applicant has met with staff on many occasions on a without prejudice basis to discuss the development limit and the extent of the natural heritage features. After reviewing the drip line in relation to the significant natural heritage features, reviewing correspondence from the Ministry of Natural Resources and the revised wetland boundary, mapping the potential buffers and staking the limit on site, the city and the applicant have come to a possible resolution on the development limit. Subsequently, Environmental and Parks Planning reviewed the additional material and met on site to confirm and stake the boundary limits of the significant areas. Also, at the time of these discussions, the applicant provided a proposed revised plan of subdivision. The applicant is now proposing 132 single detached lots, one low density block, two medium density blocks, four open space blocks, and one future access block, all served by four new local streets and one new secondary collector. The applicant has also proposed changes to the official plan and zoning bylaw. From a PPS and Planning Act perspective, the proposed draft plan is consistent with both by protecting the significant natural heritage features, ensuring and providing a mix of housing types, and supporting development with access to municipal services. The subject of site is currently designated for low density residential throughout most of the site, multifamily medium density residential along Adelaide Street, and environmental review for the natural heritage features. The applicant has proposed small changes to the OP that shift the multifamily medium density designation along Adelaide Street to the south to allow single detached dwellings to front along a proposed street B, and an increase to the open space designation and the addition of a secondary collector for Superior Drive. These, are all, these requested changes are all in keeping with the policies of the OP. From a subdivision design and zoning perspective, the revised subdivision design is minor and has essentially provided a lotting plan in place of previous blocks. 
The local roads and subdivision layout are similar to the previous draft plan, but additional local roads have been provided in place of what was previously proposed to be private roads. And with that, greater road connectivity has been provided. The associated zoning will implement the subdivision design. A dedicated open space pathway along the northern edge of the city has been provided for increased connectivity. Zoning will also ensure the delineation and protection of all natural heritage features. The proposed changes meet the policies of the official plan. Although the application and appeal predate the policies of the London plan, a review of the proposed subdivision using the policies of the new London plan was undertaken. Overall, the subdivision reflects the intent of the policies and is generally consistent with the London plan. The proposed subdivision is consistent with both the vision for neighborhood place types and the role the future development will have within the city structure. The proposed use of, of the site for single detached dwellings and cluster housing meets the locational criteria for the London plan. The single detached dwellings are situated on neighborhood streets in terms of the subdivision, while the more intensive cluster housing forms are oriented towards Adelaide Street, a Civic Boulevard. The range of housing types realizes the vision form from the London plan and provides diversity while ensuring public spaces are accessible to the population and protecting natural heritage. The proposed subdivision is also consistent with the green space place type of the London plan and is, sorry, through the system of public parks, open spaces, and natural areas included within this development. The green space place type is comprised of natural heritage features and areas recognized by city council as having significance, including contributing to important ecological functions and other natural physical features which are desirable for green space use or preservation in a natural state. The proposed subdivision overall supports the neighborhoods and green space place types, meets the vision for London, and is generally consistent with the London plan. Based on this, staff are prepared to attend the OMB in support of the revised development limit. If endorsed by Council, staff will attend the OMB to recommend the proposed revised draft plan, official plan amendment, and zoning bylaw amendments for the site as well. Thank you. Okay, colleagues looking for speakers? Seeing none, we can take a motion. Oh, sorry, Councillor Cassidy. Thank you, Madam Chair. I have one quick question of staff. Um, so, and, and I might have missed it, but it, in the original application, it said it had 330 units altogether. It didn't say um, uh, single detached homes. And then in the revised, it says 132 single detached homes. Can you give me like an apples to apples comparison? How many units are now in the, in the new? Uh... Through you, Madam Chair, uh, the problem was is that in the previous application was blocks. So the blocks allowed for things like cluster housing as well as single detached. So unfortunately, it's not really an apples to apples scenario. Um, in this particular scenario, now there's more lotting. Um, there's an actual R1 um, zoning that's being sought, which allows for just single detached dwellings. And then there's very clearly deline delineated the cluster housing blocks that are also um, part of this plan as well. So. Uh, so in the, in the previous um, iteration, then how many single detached homes were in that one, roughly? Do you have an idea? Sorry to put you on the spot. Through you, Madam Chair, it's roughly going to be about the same, I think, ultimately. Um, in terms of single detached lots, it's probably something similar in the area of about 150 units or lots, probably. Thanks. I just want to thank staff and the applicant for working together. It's, it's always great when, uh, when it can be worked out here locally in London with staff and with the applicant. So um, could, thanks very much for doing that. Thank you, Councillor. Anything further? Councillor Turner? Sorry. I and trying to go through this to get the sense of the um, uh, the, the delineation of the, uh, the environmental lands themselves. So Ms. Posado mentioned that uh, they had gone out and re reestablished the drip lines and to, and restaked that. Um, I, I didn't see a, um, 
I guess in the map here, it's, it's kind of hard to tell it, what the what the realignment of, of that was and how material that was in terms of um, uh, OS or open space that would have been redesignated. Through you, Madam Chair, um, it's difficult because I don't have the uh, original um, draft plan that was uh, redlined back in 2014. Um, but essentially, this development limit doesn't lose any open space, I guess is the best way to put it. It um, actually uh, reestablished, like I said, um, more firmly um, the uh, red lines that we as staff recommended uh, through the 2014 application. Um, the only real changes were in the uh, northeastern corner in and around where the pathway is going to be coming through there across the um, um, north end of the city. There was a small change in that area, but it didn't result in any uh, loss of natural heritage um, that we uh, noted. Um, and uh, the most important uh, piece of the open space that was kept was there was a... Um, bit of a dispute with respect to, uh, it was a stand of um, pine trees in the vicinity of um, lots towards the south end of the of this particular uh, subdivision. Um, and those were remain in the open space as part, of, and they act as additional buffer for the natural heritage. So there was um, a little back and forth on that one, but ultimately those will remain, so. All right, seeing nothing further, we can call the question on this. Closing the vote, the motion carries five to zero. Okay, and then on to deferred matters and additional business. Councillor Turner. Yeah, thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, just with respect to our earlier item on, uh, I believe it was number 11, um, I, it was a, a fair point to take a look and say, uh, could our Agricultural Advisory Committee uh, weigh in a little bit on the policy itself specifically uh, with respect to the, the sub-parceling of agricultural lands into, into smaller ag, uh, agricultural parcels? Um, it was pointed out to us that uh, uh, the Agricultural Advisory Committee did have a chance to, uh, to review the application. Uh, it provided no comments. It received the application itself. But uh, it, would, it would be interesting to know how, what their perspective is with respect to the, both the PPS and the, our official plan, the London plan, uh, and, and how we might interpret that. Uh, I'd, I'd imagine, well, I mean, ultimately it's, it's a question of council's interpretation, uh, but it's helpful to uh, be informed by, by those who are actually um, farming, uh, what the impacts are to them, uh, what the impact is to agricultural parcels and, and agricultural lands in general uh, in uh, surrounding us. So uh, what I have here in front of you is uh, just a, oh, no, I don't have that in front of you. It's got some that's going back a little bit. Uh, <laughs> sorry, I'm looking at something else. Um, uh, but uh, just a motion to ask them for uh, further input and advice on that matter. It's on my screen. Yeah. Thank you, Councillor. Yeah. Councillor Hopkins? Press the wrong button. Sorry. Yes, I, I'm very supportive of this because I know there's a number of uh, lots in uh, sort of my ward and it's always uh, a concern for me as the council of the ward how, how we maintain and, and uh, acknowledge the agricultural land that we have. So I, I guess is it going to be throughout the city of London, the urban growth boundary? I'm just wondering if we need to be specific to what areas that we're asking for their report back or will we just leave it with them? That's for you, Madam Chair, to the Councillor. Uh, uh, the intent of this is really just to take a look at um, at those parcels. Uh, well, I guess ultimately the general applicability of this, not specific to the application that came before us, uh, but more on a policy basis, and uh, and look specifically at those uh, those policy statements that uh, Mr. Adama had highlighted for us in his report, uh, PPS two three four one A, the uh, London Plan twelve twenty eight, and the OP. All right, so it's been moved and seconded. Any further discussion? Okay, seeing none, we'll call the question.
Closing the vote, the motion carries five to zero. Okay. And on to uh, confidential matters. We could take a motion to go in camera. Moved by Councillor Turner, seconded by Councillor Hopkins. Call the question. Okay. And colleagues will be in committee room three, and we will be adjourning from there also. So we don't have to come back in, so take all your stuff.